This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. everybody Merry New Year Looks like Blue moved his head around Oh well How's it going? <clears throat> yeah, thank you Norweg Getting the show started, thank you Yeah, so I thought we would finally get to the Barry and uh, Honey Sherman. We're just going to start at the, uh, <laughs> you know, just the way I normally do it. So don't jump ahead and go, hey, Grave, have you seen the video? Yeah, I've seen everything, okay? Yeah, so uh, we're just going to go through from the very beginning all the way to the end, all right? And I don't know if it'll take one day or two days or whatever it takes. I know uh, Lynette Burns up there is really into it. She actually found the uh, the location of a uh, the house where the surveillance was filmed from, so I didn't get to have the fun of looking it up myself. Thanks, Lynette. Really appreciate it. <laughs> actually, it was pretty cool. Thanks. I don't even know if I would have found it. I think I would because I'm good at that stuff. But uh, you know, hey. Uh, Chloe, what are you doing? That's not food. The blanket isn't food there. Uh, what? Wow. Yeah, I always wanted a dog like Chloe. She just kind of just randomly came across. You know, she just showed up one day, you know. Look at it, man, she almost acts like that's the greatest tasting blanket in the history of the planet. Look at this. Wow. Wow, uh, you'd have to send me an email and I, I, you know, I don't have time to go back and look. I mean, you know, here's the thing, everybody. You got to make things easy for the YouTubers, okay? We, we got a thousand emails and we spent all day trying to get ready for shows and make videos. And when you say, hey, go back and look for a comment that I made on one of your videos, I, I'm just, there's zero chance that I'm going to do that. So if you want, you can send me an email and uh, then I'll, I'll read it. Never seen her actually over there chomping away on a on a blanket. But uh, yeah, we're gonna get started on it. I, um, the thing is, Grady Judd did a uh, had a press conference the other day. It was it's like thirty something minutes long. I don't know if I'll probably just wait for that at, to the end. Maybe we'll do Sherman for a couple hours and then cut over to that. But you know, I was like listening to him. There's, I think he's talked about a few different things over the holiday weekend. Thanks, Lynette Burns. Hey, welcome. Judy Eisler-Harrod. Hopefully I said that right. Hey, 
gosh, Gray, you're so mean. I mean, why can't you spend all day looking for a comment? Gee. Ah, <laughs> uh, because I don't have time. All right. Okay. Well, anyways, I'm gonna get started on this. It's a lot of a lot of reading and stuff, so we're gonna have to. Let me get on Google Earth and get over to the uh, the right spot. Oh yeah, they've actually torn down the house. I think it, even though it was a, just an amazing house, I mean, look at this. Uh, well, they've actually torn it down because I got Chloe's just gonna make short work of that blanket. I can tell you. I pr probably nobody wanted to move into a house where there was two people that were killed. Let's see, like, look at this house in 2018, it's there, still, but then it's just gone. 2019, and, you know, I mean, it's pretty crazy to get rid of the whole thing, a pool and a, and a tennis courts and everything, I mean, jeez. All right, anyways, I'm gonna get over to the, the first article that I just randomly came across. See, this happened on, um, I think it was the uh, 14th, 13th or 14th of December. I can't remember now which day that was with the Sunday and they said it was Friday. Maybe the 15th actually. All right, so here, here's the first headline here. It said, Barry and Honey Sherman's death, Canada homicide police take over investigation. Right, and this is from the, uh, I guess the Guardian. Toronto, and all the links to all of these are in the description, right? Toronto homicide detectives have taken over the investigation of the deaths of billionaire Barry Sherman and his wife, Honey. I actually dated somebody with that name, believe it or not. <laughs> and as authorities identified the couple as the two people found dead in a North Toronto mansion on Friday. And I think this is a Sunday here. And that's them. They're Jewish, really rich billionaires. Uh, police called the deaths of the pharmaceutical, ma and the reason I'm mentioning that they're Jewish is because I think it becomes part of, uh, you know, it's, there's angles in there, I guess, that they discuss related to that. And it's also, it was a big deal in the Jewish community because they were so uh, wealthy and probably supported a lot of, I mean, I don't really know anything about them. So how about this? I'm just gonna read it. Uh, police called the deaths of the pharmaceutical magnate and his wife suspicious, but on Friday also said there were no signs of forced entry and that they were not looking for any suspect, which is crazy, really. Um, homicide detective Brandon Price told reporters on Saturday that police cannot say 100% with certainty whether or not foul play was involved. I mean, I guess I can understand if you had a double suicide, okay? And it says that they both died of ligature neck compression. The Sherman family issued a statement on Saturday urging police to conduct a thorough, intensive, and objective criminal investigation into the deaths and calling on all media to avoid speculating on the cause of deaths. The Shermans recently put up their house for sale. Uh, so maybe they were... Hmm, well, they are going to sell it for $6.9 million. Canadian and it was uh, 5.4 million U.S. Sherman founded Toronto-based Apotex Inc. in 1974 with two employees and turned the generic drug maker into a company that now has 11,000 employees worldwide. The company released a statement on Saturday paying tribute to its founder, praising both his philanthropic uh, effort and and what is described as his vision of, for health care. So I, that's what I was going to say. They probably donate a lot of money to various charities. 
Hey, thanks, Cammy Curry. I love all you guys, too. The Freak Family. Yep, and we're starting a whole new year right now. And we got to try to beat last year. And pretty soon here, I'll try to make that Stream Labs link. And I got to build my Supermax prison. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see. I think I'm going to make it like complicated. This prison that I get shoved in. We love Gray. Uh, the Shermans were among Canada's most generous philanthropic uh, th uh, philanthropists. My God, and their death shocked Canadian high society. The couple made numerous multi-million-dollar donations to hospitals, schools, and charities, and had buildings named in their honor. They hosted Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at a Liberal Party fundraiser in 2015. Honey Sherman was on the board boards of several civic groups, including Mount Sinai Women Auxiliary, the Simon Weisenthal Center, and the International American Joint Distribution Committee. <laughs> Barry Sherman was not without controversy. He faced legal action from family members alleging they had been cut out of the company over the years. Well, see, then you, you know, you sort of put that angle. Uh, you also have that same, you, people wondered that in the uh, case of, uh, what was it, what were their names? The, uh, that's how, that actually the last name sounds kind of familiar. Remember the one in Georgia, I believe, that old man, the older guy and his wife, and he had his head cut off. Russell and Shirley Dermond. You know, there was some thoughts about something similar as that. All right, so that was on December 17th, 2017, that article. And then we've got a newspapers.com article here. And this is from the uh, Montreal Gazette. Uh, they must, let's see, no no evidence detectives have botched Sherman probe. So on December 29th, literally just two weeks in, there's people already saying it was botched. They must be uh, heaving a great sigh of relief at Toronto Police Headquarters now that a real investigator has been brought in to make a proper inqui inquiries into the December 15th suspicious death Deaths of billionaires and philanthropists Barry and Honey Sherman. I refer, of course, to the fact rumored last week and widely confirmed in news reports Thursday that criminal lawyer Brian Greenspan, on behalf of the Sherman family, has hired retired Toronto homicide detective Tom Klatt and other unnamed forensic experts to ensure no stone is left unturned as Greenspan told CBS News. So I bet you at the time, these people are probably, uh, the police are just saying it was a suicide, a double suicide or something. And that's probably why they're like, the, f the family's like, there's no way in hell they would do this. We better hire our own investigator. The family has made its un unhappiness with Toronto police crystal clear, beginning with a statement released the day after the couple's bodies were discovered in their posh North York home. By then, there were um, already multiple press reports quoting unnamed police sources suggesting that an early theory was that the deaths might be a murder-suicide. Oh, I see. In other words, that Mr. Sherman might have killed his wife and then himself. Right, okay. I mean, that's... <laughs> I don't know. That's sort of weird to do it the same way. You know, I could a gun would be obvious. You shoot somebody, then you shoot yourself. But they're, they died by ligature. I mean, I think I could see somebody killing one with a ligature, but then you would find an easy, a better way to kill yourself, right? As with any unnamed sources, there's a great range of reliability with unnamed police sources and the reporters who use them. Some sources may have first-hand information or access to the actual detectives working the case, some may have gotten no closer than the guy who guarded the crime scene. Let's see. So, anyways, I think this article right here is just really talking about how they needed to get a uh, 
a their own attorney because the police didn't seem to be doing their job. All right, so I'm going to get off of that one. But it's more of an opinion type piece. All right, and then we're going to, now we're in 2018, January 23rd, the same paper. There's a picture of them right there. And I think they're talking about it again. Uh, Sherman teams share similarities. So I think this might be that same lady. But it says, uh, if it wasn't a story irredeemably sad and awful, it might be funny instead of merely rich with irony. The results of the private investigation being conducted into the deaths of billionaire philanthropists Barry and Honey Sherman sparked when unofficials, uh, um, unofficial leaks to the press suggested the tragedy was a murder-suicide, a theory that enraged the grieving family was itself leaked to reporters last weekend. Two media outlets, the Toronto Star, and the Toronto Star has one of the, you know, the sort of, uh, the reporter that everybody trusts the most named Kevin Donovan. He's in the, uh, I think it's the Toronto, isn't that the right, that's the right paper, right? Toronto Star, yeah. So two media outlets, the Toronto Star and CBS News, ran major stories last Saturday filled with details both about what may have happened to the affluent Toronto couple. The bodies of the 75-year-old founder of generic drug giant Apotex and his 70-year-old wife were discovered in their North uh, York home on Friday, December 15th. Anonymous, anonymous sources were quoted the next day saying police consider the death suspicious and that an early working theory was that it may have been a murder-suicide. The family quickly issued a statement condemning the unattributed leaks as irresponsible, urging police to keep an open mind and sharply rejected the theory of the crime. All that Toronto police have ever said officially about the case is that the deaths are suspicious. Homicide detectives and four spokesmen, Mark uh, Pugash maybe, steadfastly have refused to respond to reporters' requests for comment, denial, or information. But Saturday, all manner of lurid details about the couple's death, that their wrists had been bound, that they, they were wearing winter coats that would have immobilized their arms, that they may have died a day or two before the discovery of their bodies, that Mrs. Sherman struggled with her killer, and or killers and was found lying in a pool of her own blood and that it all looked like the work of professional killers or like a contract killing. Uh, we're, and let's see, and that, that information was splashed all over the Star and CBS website. Well, that, that one there actually seems like it could be a reality. They were murdered, read the unequivocal front page headline in the Star. Barry and Honey Sherman were murdered by multiple killers, private investigators believe. Source said the CBS for yeah. So that you know, there's a lot of people speculating out there, but one thing the family was sure about was that it wasn't a murder suicide because they know them. Again, the information was unattributed sources described this this way by the Star. People providing information for the story are not identified as they were not authorized to uh, discuss the case and the CBS simply as a source with direct knowledge of parallel probe. But later Saturday, Greenspan spoke to the Toronto Sun about the already published stories. He said he was surprised by the reports that the high, but he highly doubted the leaks had come from anyone on the, his team. Well, that, that, you know what's crazy is now, if you're like a really big news outlet, you've got connections, and there's people that are willing to leak all the time. You always see these contacts that people had. You guys remember, like the in the uh, Brian Laundry case, where we actually were aware of a gun that was missing from the house as soon as they said he was missing, and uh, I, you know, I was told that by an actual producer. Because they've got contacts out there that other people don't have, 
Uh, when we when we said it though, and it never seemed to catch on out there, people kept thinking he was on the Appalachian Trail and so forth. Alright. I think I saw Mag in here earlier. Happy New Year. I'm going to get off of this one now. So now we're just moving another all the way up into 2019 December. So berry and honey, this is December 16th and looks like it's some news outlet called McLean, McLean's. Barry and Honey Sherman murders newest twist, family and police join force. The private investigation into the Sherman's murder is complete and its tip line has been shut down, raising more questions about the two-year-old case. Since Barry and Honey Sherman were found dead in their Toronto home on December 15, 2017, the still unsolved case involving the billionaire couple has summoned far more questions than answers. The number of questions increased today with the update announcement from Toronto Police Services, Homicide, Inspector Hank Insinga, that police have forged a new cooperative relationship with the Sherman family. Uh, it, uh, let's see. Insigna? <laughs> Insigna announced that a private tip line created in October 2018 by high profile Toronto criminal lawyer Brian Greenspan, hired to represent the family, is now offline, and that the private investigation conducted by a team of Greenspan. Created is incomplete. The police investigation remains active and ongoing. Uh, Insigna said he provided ways to contact police directly. He sounded upbeat, noting the next weeks are going to be very, very busy going through information, and police have been getting a lot of great information from a lot of great sources. The new alliance represents a 180-degree shift from the family's prior conflict-ridden glacial relationship with police. The first signs of that conflict were evident hours after Honey and Barry Sherman's uh, bodies were found. The couple's children were angry that the police didn't immediately declare the case a double homicide, which stoked speculation about a possible murder-suicide. In a December 16th statement, the family forcibly or forcefully rejected and suggested any suggestion that their 75-year-old father could have killed their 70-year-old mother and then himself calling police source irresponsible. The schism widened with the family's immediate hiring of Greenspan. Within days, the lawyer had assembled a team of retired hom homicide cops Forensic specialists, so they just immediately created their own force, basically, uh, and pathologists to conduct a parallel investigation. It seems like, I don't know how they would have got access to everything. Maybe it's different in Canada, I don't know. But, uh, six weeks later, in January 2018, TIPS announced that the Shermans both died of ligature neck compression and that the case was being investigated as a targeted double homicide. Hiring Greenspan wasn't the only privilege the Shermans' wealth afforded. The family's means also allowed them to shroud details of the investigation, including going to court to keep details of the Shermans' wills unavailable to the public, contrary to common practice. Their privilege also saw them enlisting prominent family friends, including Toronto Mayor John Tory and Senator Linda Forum, to convey their concerns about the investigation to police. Tensions between the family and police were all were on full display at a lengthy press conference held by, I wonder if that's uh, something you can watch by clicking on this. Thank you for your attendance today. My name is Brian Greenspan. On Saturday, December 16th, 2007. Yeah, I don't know if we can, that's a YouTube. Maybe we'll check that out another time, but. Let's see. The creation of a private tip line raised concerns about two communication streams with no apparent coordination. Greenspan said the team would pass on credible tips to police. 
uh, though how credible would be decided uh, was unclear. The sudden show of family solidarity and solidarity between the family and police comes in the wake of the recent publication of the billionaire murders by Toronto Star investigative reporter Kevin Donovan. So there you go. I mean, he's the guy everybody talks about. Who concludes the murders were committed by a person or persons familiar with the Shermans. The book reveals conflict and tension within the family between the only son, Jonathan Sherman, and his parents, between the four siblings and the exile of Honey's sister, Mary Schechtman, from the family. Hmm. So now you've got maybe people that are like, you're living too long. You know, we, we, we need to get our, our inheritance. I don't want to work for it. Just give it to me. Maybe some angle like that, right? So you've got between the only son, Jonathan Sherman, and his parents, between the four siblings. Okay. So that was the only son. There must be three daughters or something. Let's see. Reveal the conflict and tension within the family between the only son, Jonathan Sherman, and his parents, between the four siblings and the exile of Honey's sister. Okay, so the aunt of the kids. Uh, Donovan has also written that police have said they have a theory of the case but won't comment on the suspects. Today, Idzigna spoke of the police being in daily communication with, me with members of the Sherman family and that police have a very good relationship with them now. He praised the family, saying they have been terrific with us, very cooperative. Asked by a reporter if the family had hired the Greenspan team, uh, Insigna refused to answer. That's a question for the Sherman family. Uh, Greenspan has remained uncharacteristically silent on the matter. McLean's request for comment went unanswered. A Greenspan spokesperson had told media that Greenspan remains an adv advisor, consultant, and spokesperson. All right. So, hmm, that's sort of interesting now. You've got some motive ideas being thrown out there. And I think the next day in the paper, this one's on newspapers.com, December 17th in the National Post. I think that's pretty much the same thing. They're just talking about the tips. I'm going to skip over to this one. This one's 2020 October. Sherman hires, or heirs. Hires, wow. Whew. Sherman heirs fight to keep inheritance secret. I wonder why that's something. Because I think it probably points to something. You know, it makes you wonder if they're a little nervous. I mean, why would they care? Right? Nobody knows anything about this case that we know of. Let me, let me zoom in. Like, so far away from me. Nobody knows anything about this case that we know of. Nobody knows the motive. Nobody knows the assassin's names. This exasperated assessment of the investigation into the deaths of Toronto billionaires Honey and Barry Sherman probably matches what almost everyone thinks of the inordinately high profile murder mystery. This, this though, was ex exclaimed, uh, exclaimed from the Supreme Court of Canada's bench by Justice Russell Brown in, in a hearing Tuesday into attempts by a billionaire uh, heirs and trustees to seal tight a court file on the handling of the couple's inheritance. Another justice, Michael Mold Moldever, speculated the murders have been committed by a very sophisticated organization. At, at least it has, um, has those hallmarks and characterized as a very, very sophisticated crime. While the judges' musings on the spectacular crimes came 
in a quest to understand the intricacies of legal argument, they also reflect the case. Uh, let's see. They also, I think, I think it's down here. They also reflect the conjecture, concern, and uncertainty over the unsolved murders. Uh, the Shermans, giant in the business philanthropy and high society, were found dead in their Toronto mansion on December 15, 2017. Their bodies were seated side by side with belts tethered, tethering their necks to a low railing at the edge of their indoor pool. After first suggesting it may have been a murder-suicide, Toronto police later announced it was a targeted double homicide with the cause of death in both being ligature neck compression. So it sounds like the police have switched over. Yeah. Let's see. Despite huge public interest, a police investigation, a probe by private investigators hired by the family, and a $10 million reward. That's how huge the reward is. Uh, the case remains unsolved. Hey, thanks, Jessica Schubach. Yeah, I know. Uh, here's the thing, everybody. Sometimes we do shows that aren't as, like, that generate the same enthusiasm as other cases. But we gotta, you know, if we want to keep doing what we've been doing, it's got to be the same every single night. You know, so it doesn't have, we, we can't cover Delphi 365 days of the year. And as you know, I don't do that. Thank you, Jessica Schubach. In a search for answers, media sought the Sherman's wills and inheritance proceedings, but the files had already been sealed by a highly unusual judge's order. An appeal of that sealing order of the court appeal uh, order to the Court of Appeal for Ontario by Kevin Donovan. An investigative reporter with the Toronto Star successfully overturned the order, but the Sherman's estates in turn appealed to the Supreme Court seeking to restore it. Wow. So that investigative reporter actually got the order to, uh, to unseal it, and then the family had to go to the highest court <laughs> to try to get it sealed again. So that's pretty good work by the reporter there. Yeah. Hmm. The case uh, was heard Tuesday. Uh, lawyers for the estates argued the appeal court's decision disregards the increasing emphasis on privacy in Canadian law. Uh, they characterized the media's interest as puerile only because of the Sherman's wealth and the circumstances of their deaths and that the sealed files should remain a private matter. Hey, thank you, Meg. They said the files contain names and addresses of innocent parties, including children, and also provide a link between cer uh, let's see, certain of the affected individuals and the Shermans, which would not otherwise be apparent. They reiterated the argument made when the files were initially sealed that the beneficiaries and trustees face a serious risk of their safety. Hmm. Well, they already know you're billionaires. I don't know how that would make you... Hold on a second. Thank you, Tracy. Hmm. Uh, they reiterate. I don't know how it would make them put them in danger. Everybody knows they're billionaires. Arguing that the files should remain unsealed and the information be made public, Iris Fisher, representing the Star and Donovan, said the position of the Sherman. Uh, Much in, appreciation for all you do, Gray. Well, thank you. In counter to the open court principles. So, yeah, I mean, the thing is it should be available and they're asking for something extraordinary to have it sealed when other people don't. 
So, I mean, this case is kind of interesting because it, it's a little bit like the Murdoch case where you got these really privileged people that they, you know, they can buy anything and pretty much have their way all the time. I mean, they basically created their own police force. I mean, they hired a bunch of uh, retired detectives and forensic people, and they're just like, you know, competing side by side. Huh? That doesn't make any sense, Sarah. I gotta retype that one. Toronto police spokeswoman Megan Gray told National Post their investigation of the Sherman's murder is active and ongoing. She confirmed that Yim is assigned full time to the case, but said only investigators assist while ju uh, that other investigators assist while juggling other investigations. So, anyways, you know, they still don't have an answer back then. Thank you, Kathy Friedenmaker. All right, so this one is June 16th, 2021. All right, so state files reveal Sherman's plan for their future. This one's by Tyler Dawson in the National Post. Hmm. All right, so let's see what this one says. There they are again. The murders of Barry and Honey Sherman, the philanthropic, uh, th uh, philanthropic, well, philanthropic, I guess is what you'd say, billionaires. I'm trying to get, it's hard for me to read when there's only three words a line because you know how your mind wants to continue on and you can kind of see it. Uh, the, let's see, who were found dead in their Toronto mansion in December 2017 remain an enduring mystery through nearly unsealed, for, uh, through nearly unsealed doc, uh, court documents shed some light on what is to happen to the fortune the couple left behind. The release of the estate files in the culmination of a year-long legal battle by media organizations to gain access to documents that can usually be accessed via Canada's open court principle, the idea that court proceedings can be viewed by members of the media and public so as to improve understanding of and confidence in the justice system. The estate records were sealed from public scrutiny after the Shermans were found dead in their two-story home with a lower court suggesting the information could put beneficiaries of the will at risk. No arrests have been made in relation to the double murder that shocked Toronto more than three years ago. I mean, I don't know how it would put them at more at risk. <laughs> you know, it's uh, everybody out there already knows that they have kids. I think it's just there's something they don't want in there. I, I don't, it just seems odd. Barry Sherman, 75, was the founder of Apotex, a pharmaceutical company founded in 1974 that produces generic drugs undercutting the price of name brand competitors. Honey Sherman, 70. You know, so after your, you know, when you create a drug, you get like 20 years or so, and then your patent runs out. And then generic drug makers can make the drug for way cheaper and then it undercuts the original company but it's you know it goes on all the time <clears throat> honey sherman let's see the company founded in 1904 that produces generic drugs undercutting the price of name brand competitors honey sherman 70 was a philanthropist the two met in 1970 and married in 1971. honey sherman left no will but her husband had two. Wow, so the husband had two different wills, I guess. The money they left behind, the estate documents say, is to be divided equally among the couple's four children, Lauren, Jonathan, Alexandra, and Kaylin. So that's, I got that right, there's one son and three daughters. 
However, the money, okay, so the couple divided equally. However, the money is to be held in trust until the children reach the age of 25. Well, aren't they already 25? I mean, my God, they're fit. Well, they must be, they must have been like 50 years old when they had the kids. When they will receive one quarter of their inheritance. Then one third upon reaching age of 30, the will says, they will receive the full portion at age 35 as an annual income. Wow, they were just set up to not fail, <laughs> you know. But that's kind of the way you should do it. Like if you if you have twenty million dollars and you have kids, I think like the will would, would be so much better if you gave them like, yeah, let's say you had two kids and there was twenty million you could give out. You give them each a million or like two million to start off with, and then you give them, you know, three hundred thousand dollars a year income for. For, you know, 30 years or something, you know. I mean, I don't know if the math worked out there, but I'm just saying. That way it protects them against themselves as, of being idiots. Upon their deaths, Barry Sherman held 67 million in personal property and 1.8 million in real estate. Wow, so personal property, is that like gold? And because real estate is right here. I don't know what that means. I wonder what personal property is. Uh, Honey Sherman had 45.9 million in personal property and 9.5 million in real estate. This figure covered by the estate files though represents a fraction of their true wealth. Forbes estimates Barry Sherman was worth around three billion dollars at the time of his death. The couple was well known in philanthropic circles, having given millions of dollars to a variety of charitable organizations, including the United Way and the United Jewish Appeal. Or what is that? What it's called? Did I say that right? United Way and the United Jewish Appeal. I've never heard that one before. They also have generously, gave generously to uh, community centers and other facilities in the Toronto area. But the will leaves no money to charity. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, she gave, well, they, you know, maybe they gave so much money to charity while they were alive that they were, they gave all the remaining money to their children. I don't know. Police in Toronto continue to investigate what they're saying was a double homicide, though. Uh, little information about has been made public, and no suspects has, have been identified in the investigation. The family had also hired a private investigative team to look into the deaths and offered a, a, an award of $10 million for information that could solve the case. The identity of the person who made the initial request for the records to be kept secret was also revealed in the documents released Friday. It was Bradley uh, Krocek, maybe, who married, who's married to Alexandra Sherman. And who was Alexandra again? Anybody remember? Let me type that in. No, that's just one of the uh, sisters here. It was Bradley Krocek who, the identity of the person who made the initial request for the records to be kept secret was also revealed in the document. So it was weird, it was the husband of one of the siblings. There, are, there is a real and substantial risk that the applicants, the children and their, and their children will suffer serious harm, detriment, or injustice from public exposure of the materials, particularly in the circumstances that the identity and motivation of the perpetrator of the murders remains a mystery. And that's what this guy wrote, Krawcheck, or whatever, I don't know how, what his name really is, but I'm, 
I'm guessing it's Krachek. The Toronto Star appealed the lower court decision to the Ontario, uh, Ontario Court of Appeals and won. The estate then appealed to the nation's top court, hoping to have the, over, uh, the order overturned. In October 2020, before the Supreme Court, the lawyers for the estate argued the media interest in the documents was uh, puerile and they were sought only because of the Shermans' wealth and the circumstances of their death. The submissions before the Supreme Court of Canada, which unsealed the records, the Sherman's estate trustees said, there would be a serious in invasion of privacy and grave physical safety risks. I don't know about, I don't understand the physical safety risk part of it. On Friday, in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court of Canada disagreed, disagreed saying the family had failed to establish a significant risk to their safety. There you go. Boom. See? <laughs> That's what I was thinking the whole time. I mean, how would it make them any, in any more danger now? You know, they would have taken out all the family members on the same night if they were in danger, if they were part of whatever the reason they were killed. Yeah. It's okay to get pregnant. I mean, uh, they're 50 years old, though, you guys. That's what I'm telling you. There was, you know, some of these kids were less than 20. You know, they must have been, um, she was 45 or 50 when she had the, the kids. Okay? I mean, if that's true, that some of them were below the age of 25. All right? Uh <laughs> Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll let you everybody get it out of their system. You can all tell how old you, you you were when you had your babies. No, I was never born. I'm not real. I'm a robot. Yes, he is a robot. See, I told you, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Man, it was like we brought that up 20 minutes ago. And we're on to, there was some other interesting stuff, and people are still in that topic. Amazing. Well, good. Awesome. All right, so let me uh, get rid of that one. And, all right, now we got one from that Kevin Donovan individual via Lynette Burns. I'm using, uh, let me see. So this is one from December 19th of this year. Not sure why that's opened up two there. But. So let's read this. One year ago, the Toronto Star obtained police search warrant documents that described the first three months of the investigation into the deaths of billionaire Barry and Honey Sherman. We learned about the discovery of the bodies, the police missteps, including the focus on murder suicide and how the four Sherman children insisted. That was ridiculous. Today, the star reveals the next three months of the investigation, the period from April to June 2018, based on newly released police documents. Gosh, Gray, why can't they talk about the dates that everybody was born and the ages? Because we were just moving on to the other topics now. Gosh, Gray, that's so mean. <laughs> Uh-oh, everybody. Mary Lou said I was so mean. <laughs> Guess what that means? It means that poor Gray, you know, after being so nice, has been thrown into the brink. Now, it's not Supermax or anything, 
Uh, one of these days, that is going to happen, though. There's going to be this whole thing that makes a loud noise and goes... And we might have to have little things that you can... You know, I don't know. It might be like a, like a locks and keys, all kinds of stuff. To get me the hell out. Maybe a bobby pin to pick the lock. We just don't know. That's right. I'm in jail right now. And then we'll get right back to the, the story. I know. Wouldn't that be great to uh, get put the the spoiler alert people in prison? The ones that just can't ever keep their mouth shut whenever you're talking about a case. They always want to let everybody know how much they know and you know try to impress everybody with all their knowledge when everybody's trying to just learn it for the first time as it happened. Yeah, it's amazing. I, mind-boggling even if you say it a thousand times it's the same thing I guess uh, it feels like I'm I am there's a there's a want to keep me in here <laughs> now so you bought me something to eat Angela Vincent thanks a lot oh look at that I got a skeleton key from Mag and Amber Maiden, cab ride home, and we are looking good. Now, actually, Mag's was for the skeleton key, bribing the guards, and then Amber Maiden got me a uh, cab ride out. All right. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely gonna. I need something like that, like a skeleton key or something like that. All right, there we go. Thank you. Gosh, Curry, that was too quick. You left Brandon there for so long. I want to be in the bed for a long time, Jerry. See, can you tell that's not me doing it? That is a, there is a Mary Lou here. Jerry, let it go. <laughs> All I need now is a little puppet. <laughs> I need like a little Mary Lou puppet that I can have him in this hand. And then a different camera that's just filming the hand there. <laughs> That'd be pretty funny, actually. Yeah. Oh, it must have been Melissa Burns. Hmm. Not sure if I'm the only spoiling everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to hear the story? Okay, yeah. All right, so anyways, here we go. Uh, we learned about the discovery of the bodies, the police missteps, including the focus on murder-suicide and how the four Sherman children insisted that uh, that it was ridiculous. Hey, thanks, Ink Twin Nine. <laughs> yeah, well, I try to make people laugh, you know. But it sort of became part of the show now is that every night we're, you know, raising funds for, you know, allows me to keep doing what I'm doing and it also uh, donations to charity. And by the way, I looked it up. Thanks for making uh, me smile. We donated in the last two years to, I think, uh, uh, two different charities. Uh, well, Texas Sequa Search is $10,000, I, I believe, something like that. And... Um, Nick Mech was like eight something, and Rain was way up in the into the over five thousand dollars. So, you know, because of you guys, we we were able to do that. Right. All right. So here we go. We learned about the discovery of the bodies, the police missteps, including the focus on murder suicide and how the four Sherman children insisted that, w that it was ridiculous. Today, the star reveals the next three months of the investigation, the period from April to June 2018, based on newly released police documents. Six months into the Toronto police probe of Barry and Honey Sherman's murders, homicide detectives were nowhere, uh, not nowhere at all. It was a whodunit. Theories and tips were flying at them. And hold on a second, I gotta. My wife just came home, just a second.
All right. Hey, thanks, B Mountains. Yeah, I'm just trying to put all these together. It took a long time to get everything. Yeah, see, see, but but see, that's what that's, that's what you're doing. See, Lynette Burns, even right then when you sing, oh, it's tough. Oh, oh, let me do. You just want everybody to know that you're really into the case. Okay, just let let's just go through it, and we'll read through it, and later on we'll have a big old big big old call in where everybody can call in and everybody can tell their theories. All right, it'll be really fun. Hey, everybody, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I, I know this case inside and out. I know every single detail. I'll just <laughs> let me let me zip it, though. OK. Oh, wow. Gray, you you're like, a you know, all this. Yeah, I know how it works. All right. Uh, Lauren was 43. Jonathan was 34. Alex was 32 and here was 27. OK, so then why would they say after 20? OK, so they she was reasonable ages then. She was 30 or 27 and then 36 and then 43. Oh, and then also uh, 38. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I mean, Lynette's, we, we you know, she, uh, she's a little bit like a, another Zozo for me. <laughs> We're always battling back and forth. You know, I'm just flipping her crap. Mainly because she went out and found the location of the, uh, where the, there's a surveillance footage that they've just recently released that we haven't got to yet, before I even got to go look at it, Okay. So I feel bad now. Thanks, Hillbilly Uncensored. Oh yeah. Do I need to make the milk jug emoji with like uh, like somebody's face leaning against it, maybe? Yeah, we do. Uh, LM, what made you have to type that in? Jesus. <laughs> we, we love you, Lynette. Oh, boy. It's so horrible in here. We better... Greg, here's a down payment on a milk jug emoji. I think that'd be pretty mouth. funny. Thanks for keeping it real. I don't know. Put, like, milk jug right on its face, maybe? Or... I mean, I'm basically doing this show for uh, Lynette. You know, like... I was going to put it off for a while after I realized it's kind of this deep thing. And then she was sending me, you know, some of these uh, articles. So I figured, ah, I'll just do it. Because it does remind me of the Murdoch case a little bit. <laughs> she probably disappeared. She, she's scared that if she says something, it'll reveal something. Hmm. Yeah, that was pretty fun when everybody sent that in. Ah, oh, God, here we go. There goes LM again. She can never just go a week without it just turning into some wild shit. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's crazy, Lynette. That's what I'm saying. Everybody makes it sound like... <laughs> See? That's what I'm saying. You know... I'm just flipping Lynette Burns crap like she does to me a lot of times in the comments my god you people that's when I found you was the milk jug yeah well did you do the milk jug experiment hillbilly uncensored yeah okay here we go let's uh uh, six months into the Toronto Police Pro, Barry and Honey Sherman's murder, homicide detectives were nowhere, uh, whodunit theories and tips were flying at them. One came from a man who overheard gossip in the hot tub at a fitness club. An aunt and nephew figured it might be a religious crime, and the four Sherman children were pointing fingers at several people. Everything had to be checked out. I think the the, the Sherman 
uh, children would have a better idea, you would think, maybe. If, especially maybe the oldest one. You know, if he was close enough to the father to maybe hear about stuff going on in the background. Currently, several persons have been implicated through witness statements as, a, as responsible for the murders of Bernard Sherman and Honey Sherman. A homicide detective wrote in an application for a production order in June 2018, but the detective noted that to date there is no evidence to elevate any of the uh, aforementioned parties to the status of suspect. The detective had a long list of cellular phone numbers and they wanted access to all to the call log and geolocation data that would tell them who uh, who was and was not around the Sherman residence. That almost sounds like a data dump, doesn't it? <laughs> See? Yeah. She wants to kill me at the time, she said. <laughs> well, um, Sherlock Hemlock, we went through that. It was 40, uh, uh, 43, uh, 34, 33, and... Uh, and LM, we love you too, So okay? how old were the parents Just when they had know, these LM, kids? Just let me know, LM, we love you too. Just kidding. Yeah, thank you, Sherlock. A lot. That was actually pretty funny. <laughs> We're going to do an entire expose and a show on the age of Honey Sherman when she produced all four children. It'll be absolutely incredible. Hold on to your seats, everybody. <laughs> oh, wow. There it is. A scream and then troll. <laughs> All right, that was good. That was good. Or let's do your sound effect. Hold on, here it is. This is uh Troll. There you go. Did it all just for you. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Uh, currently, several persons have been implicated through witness statements as responsible for the murders. The detective had a long list of cellular phone numbers and they wanted access to the call log and geolocation. So it sounds like they actually had a, a list and they wanted to see where all those people were. They should have done like a data dump. The information in, in the story comes from an ongoing Toronto Star investigation, including search warrant documents released by the Ontario Court of Justice following a successful challenge of a blanket sealing order. Barry, founder of genetic drug company Apotex, and his wife, Honey, had been found dead beside the basement swimming pool in their home, each with a man's leather belt around their neck, tied to a low railing above. So it, you know, that looks sort of like the auto asphyxiation thing that you hear about. Now some people kill themselves like that in prison. So I can sort of see why maybe at first they were like uh, murder suicide because maybe he killed his wife doing the same thing and then did, did the exact same thing to himself. But it doesn't make sense. I don't think the second person would do the exact same thing like that. Yeah, we know care care. Uh, you, if you throw something like that at again, you'll you'll be by care. Okay. Toronto homicide detectives considered for six weeks the possibility that Barry killed Honey, then killed himself. Five weeks after the bodies were found, a Toronto Star story prompted police to interview the pathologist hired by the Sherman family to conduct second autopsies. The police interview of the more experienced pathologist led to Barry's death also being classified as a murder. So that's the house right there. Let me uh, go down here really quick and 
Check it out. I don't know if it's still there on this street view. Oh yeah, this is after they've torn it down and there's construction going on here. Uh, hold on, I can get it though. Look at, look at, look at Google Maps. I got it right here. Ah, God. What the heck was that? I grabbed the, the, uh, human little dude from Google Earth. All right, right there. And then if we go back, there we go. We got 2009. Okay, now it's switched again. That's 2009. And apparently that's kind of where they parked right off, off to the side there. Okay, just stay there. Okay, this is 2014 right there. Definitely see that. And they actually have a, a garage where it's under the, you know, like a, a drive-in garage, not like a normal garage, you know, like a hotel almost, it seemed like. A parking garage, you know, where you drive underneath it. But I guess they normally would park out here. Let's see what this one is. So that's one of them, you know, like that's... They probably were living here in two, July 2014. That's just, uh, 2015. They definitely... I don't know when they bought the house, but... Okay, so they were dead. This is the last known... Google Street View shot of July 2016 here. So they lived for another year and a half after this. And then this next one is a, uh, about seven months after the murders. This one right here. So it's still there. And then 2019 it's bordered up and 2020 because it's been torn down. God, it was crazy because it was, looked like it was a really nice house. Oh yeah, and this is where Lynette Burns found the... It's a pretty good find. I, I'll give you credit for that. Oh, come on, you're not going to watch the rest of this, Lynette? This is all for you. <laughs> Man, forget it. Actually, it's for all the freaks. I was going to do this the other night. But I, it turns out there was a lot more to it, it looked like. So I didn't want to just do one of those quick uh, flyby, you know, like, hey, here's a story, yay. Alright, so Honey left Apotex before 6.30 p.m. Alright, let's get, this is like a timeline here. The detectives had a long list of cellular data and they wanted around 50 Old Colony Road, yep. As previously reported, Barry and Honey met with builders of their new home at, approx at Apotex offices at 5 p.m. The meeting was to have been at Old Colony, but for some unknown reason was changed to Apotech. Hmm, that's interesting. So these builders were supposed to meet them at their home that they currently lived at. I wonder if they were going to rebuild that actual home. I don't, I don't know. Uh, builder Joe Brennan recalled to police that while Barry normally worked late, he commented 
that he had a reason to be home earlier than usual. The meeting was to be at Old Colony, but for some unknown reason was changed to Apotex. Builder Joe Brennan recalled the belief that while Brennan, while Barry normally worked late, he commented that he had a reason. Hmm, wonder what that would have been. And he didn't want the builders there almost like to not see somebody. I don't know. Honey left Apotex before 6.30 in her champagne-colored Lexus SUV, which I think is what we're seeing, I think, in that one... Let's see. Not 100% sure, but I think on the one... 2005, that was it, 14? That one right there. I think that might be it right there, right? Looks like an SUV. Uh, what do you guys think? You think that's it? Lexus SUV and Honey left Apodex before 6.30 in a champagne colored Lexus SUV and the three builders left in another vehicle. Honey pocket dialed one builder by mistake and he heard her giggling for about 20 seconds before she ended the call. While Barry stayed at work until about 8.30 p.m. Honey drove to Bayview Village Shopping Center. Right, let's see where that is. All right, so she was here. Uh, CIBC branch. What is CIBC branch? Is that a bank? Now there it is. Right, right exactly where I put the pin, if you can believe that. Man, I get lucky like that sometimes. Isn't that weird? at the uh, Bayview Village Shopping cent Center. Yeah, well apparently it's inside. There, there it is right there. But it's probably you go inside and you take a left. And that was at, uh, so she was there between seven and eight. Document indicates she went to CIBC branch between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. and also to the Mac Cosmetics store inside the mall. All right, gotta do that one then. Mac Cosmetics.
It's always kind of weird when you think about, like, you know, she's just doing mundane, normal stuff, you know, just, you know, absolutely, you know, likely completely unaware that something negative, I mean, horrible, is going to be happening to them. Didn't mean to dumb it down with the word negative. That just sounds like, well, you know, I stubbed my toe on a... Yeah. It was not until four months after the murders that the police went to Bayview Village looking for a security video. Most of the video had been overwritten, but they were able to obtain footage of Honey at the CIBC branch. This part of the police documents is heavily redacted, but given that the branch would be long closed by the time Honey arrived, it is possible the video police have shows Honey taking out cash from the ATM. That kind of makes sense. Police have continued to seal any information regarding that what time the Shermans arrived home. The star's previous reporting suggests Honey was home by 8.30 by Bayview Mall. Uh, the Bayview Mall is less than 10 minute drive from Old Colony and very shortly after. So they got both got home around maybe like 8.30. No, he left. He left his work at eight. Let me see where that is, by the way. Apotex. Uh, where's that? No, uh, well, there's one right there. No, that's him. That's, that's not it. Although, why is it... <laughs> it's actually a pin that shows up on his house. See that Apotex? 50 Old Colony Road. So, obviously that wasn't where he would work, but it's probably the next... No, there's a whole bunch of places over here then. So, I don't really know. We'll just, we'll just say, you know, Apotex, that one right there. It's interesting, though, that he owns it, but, it, I mean, it has his address as one of the actual Google Earth company names and addresses. As they work to complete a timeline of events, detectives conducted interviews with family and friends, uh, Mary Sheckman, Honey's sister and aunt, to four Sherman children, told police she believes that there may be a religious motive, noting to detectives that the Shermans were strong supporters of Israel and Honey was very local about being Jewish. Ah, I don't think so. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of Jewish people out there. I don't think that uh, that had anything to do with it. Thank you, Eugenie! Oh, look at the little lemon face. The... I was just looking at it. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that one before. That was the old Dadio Caspi and Horses Rock selections. The Lemon Face. Uh, Ted Florence, a nephew of Barry and Honey, told police something similar, saying it could also be religious hate crime because the Shermans were involved in the Jewish community. Uh, police hit upon a plan involving cellular telephone communications. Police decided to gather all of the cellular numbers for any person in the Sherman family orbit. That makes sense. Including most family members, <coughs> many friends, and business associates, including employees of Apotex. Yeah, and then you see where their phones pinged on that night. And then does it make sense that they would be somebody that would do them harm? The science behind such a request is this. If you have your cellular phone turned on, it pings off a, a telecommunications tower and provides the approximate location. A person of interest in, is on one rung below a suspect. Police have explained the application was granted by Justice Leslie Pringle. Uh, what does it say there? In their application to get permission to legally breach the privacy rights of many cellular phones, subscribers, police say they were 
trying to include or exclude people from being persons of interest. A flaw in this investigation, investigative approach, of course, is that anyone using a burner phone, a disposable phone with airtime purchase with cash, would not be picked up. And also, um, you'd be an absolute fool and an idiot to, um, if you're going to do a hit on somebody, to bring your cellular phone with you. I think that's the bigger thing. You would be a moron to take your cell phone into a crime scene, commit a murder, and then leave them. Thank you, Tracy Nixon. The star does not know which cellular phones were requested by police. Jonathan told the star last year that I would hope they have looked at all the family. Jonathan has enlisted the services of a New York lawyer to help with his own investigation of the murders, he told the star. Right, uh, let's see what we got. So there's the house right there. Barry, founder of generic drug company Apotex, and his wife, Honey, had been found dead beside the basement swimming pool in their home, each with a man's leather belt around their neck tied to a low railing above. The cause of death was ligature neck compression, a small mark on Honey's right eye believed to be the result of her being struck caused police to quickly label Honey's case as murder. Toronto homicide detectives considered for six weeks the possibility that Barry killed Honey, then killed himself. Five weeks after the bodies were found, a Toronto Star story prompted police to interview the pathologist hired by the Sherman family to conduct a second autopsy. Let's see. There are extensive... Redactions. We already read that part up above, by the way. There are extensive redactions in this report of, of police documents, the names of at least three men who separately knew their father and the children's theories as to why they were involved. Jonathan gave two sworn statements. In one, he said there are people out there that would have a grudge against them and would have a reason to hurt them. Lauren, the eldest Sherman child who lives in Whistler, B.C., also pointed police in a direction. In the portion of her statement that was redacted, she said it was ridiculous to think that her parents killed themselves or their father killed their mother. She described them as a really lovable, as real, really lovable people. She did tell police that when she was growing up, her parents were the swearing and screaming type but said they never got physical daughters alexandra and kaylin and their perspective partner brad krachek and jared render also provided the suspicious uh, suspicions the documents reveal the star knows through interviews with family members including jonathan and alexandra the identities of at least two of the individuals both men put forward by the children as potential suspects were, uh, let's see, uh, we are not identifying them at this time. Both men were interviewed by the police and the star. Both provided alibis to police and the star for their whereabouts, and they said they had nothing to do with the murders. By the summer of 2018, police have interviewed about 150 people made up of family and friends, uh, let's see. The newly released documents also reveal that police during the first six months period spent time trying to understand the Sherman family dynamics and Barry's business and investments. Alex uh, Glassenberg, who runs Sherman or uh, Surefam, Barry's investment and holding company, told police that he and Jack K, Barry's second in command at Apotex, had prior to the murders been trying to convince the 75-year-old Barry to sell Apotex. Hmm, I wonder if that would have made him rich. Barry was not interested, the document uh, show. Glassenberg said he was quite involved with assisting the four children in financial matters. And as an example, he had once convinced Barry to give daughter Alexandra and her husband Brad $10 million to invest in 
Sure, fam. Glassenberg said Barry gave the four children salaries, all different amounts, and the youngest, Kalen, received the least, Glassenberg told police, that while Barry had set up trusts for each child, Barry held all the voting shares. Hmm. Which one was Barry? Ah, oh, man. I probably should, because mother is Barry's sister. If any nephew of Barry... I can't remember who Barry was. You guys don't remember who Barry was? Oh, there it is. Barry and Honey. Oh, but no, I know who Barry is, but I'm trying to... Is there a younger Barry? <laughs> I mean, Barry's the main character, but down here it sounded like Barry was getting... He had once convinced Barry to give daughter Alexandra and her husband Brad $10 million to invest in SureFan. Glassmore said Barry gave the four children salaries, all different amounts, and the youngest, Caitlin, received the last. I told police that while Barry had set up trust for each child, Barry held... Oh, okay, so I guess he... That's what... He's... <laughs> I don't know why why I, that was that wasn't confusing at all, but I made it confusing in my brain. Maybe that's what me you only get six hours of sleep. Told police that while Barry had set up trust for each child, Barry held all the voting shares. So he didn't let the kids decide on a damn thing. That's what he what they're saying. Police interviewed Jonathan's husband Fred and Jonathan's previously boyfriend Andrew and Jonathan's previous boyfriend, Andrew Liss, Fred told police that Barry was a nice person, but Honey was harder to read and he felt he did not like him at first, but that their relationship was improving. He said that the Shermans once toured the family through the basement showing off their pool, and Fred said he would go downstairs when he wanted to get away from people during family dinners. Andrew Liss told police that he started dating Jonathan when Andrew was 14. Okay, Andrew Liss told police that she started dating Jonathan when Andrew was 14. Hmm. And that Barry invested fifty million in a house building and selling business. Man, this is good. See, see what I'm saying? It's like the Murdoch. There's so much stuff going on in the background. So that must is that a gay couple then, right here? I'm just trying to make get it make it make sense. He started dating so Andrew List told police that he started dating Jonathan. So I'm assuming that Andrew and Jonathan are both guy names, you know, when Andrew was 14, as to the relationship with Barry and Honey, Andrew told police he respected Barry, but Honey did not like him because Honey thought Andrew made Jonathan gay, oh, there you go, the business collapsed, Jonathan and Andrew broke up, Andrew recalled, and he felt betrayed because he considered the Shermans as family. The business collapsed. Jonathan and Andrew broke up. Andrew recalled. Hmm. Chewbacca? I see that. Interesting case. Thanks, Gray. Thanks, your gypsy. <laughs> Look at that. Lynette Burns, she was dead asleep right there. She was laying on her pillow. and But she was still listening. Hey! Wait. He was adopted. All right, so out of the four kids, one was adopted. Lauren, the eldest Sherman child, told police that their father had always wanted herself and her brother Jonathan to succeed, to succeed him and take over the company, but they did not. Hmm. Well, there you go. But there's a whole bunch of, you know, you can tell that some motives are being plopped in there. And then we also got the, 
the next day there's another article by Kevin Donovan again on the 20th of December so these are all pretty recent here <laughs> oh yeah is it maybe is that why they adopted him because he was a boy And that's ironic in a way that he turned out to be gay too, right? Like, I mean, I wonder what. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting mag right there. Yeah. So his only son was adopted. Yeah, I think so. Let me go back to the uh, previous article here. I don't remember if this is the one that had the names of all the kids in there. Okay, yeah, so I think Jonathan's the one male. And he was the one... And he was the one that uh, was adopted. So maybe... You know, I mean... In, I mean, the thing is, in Judaism and Islam, Islam, you know, the male... There's always, like, the, a male-female component. Right? So I'm wondering if that was something... He wanted his name to continue on. And that's sort of ironic that he's gay, right? Because then, well, I guess he could have adopt a child with somebody else and then they use his name and then that would continue on. But Oh, you can listen to it tomorrow, Lynette. No big deal. <laughs> no, no big deal. Police probing Sherman murders learned of mysterious suspect with odd walk almost four years ago. See, isn't that crazy? Four years ago. And see, I'll, I'll show you guys right now the video, because this video just came out. So this is the one that Lynette Burns went and found. Uh, it, it's a pretty good find. I don't know if she got some information you know, like a street name or something, but you have, you know, it's pretty hard to find it. You know, one of the things would be that there's a sidewalk here that's on this, this surveillance footage, and then most of these areas, for some reason, don't have sidewalks, so you could look around and find that, and then start looking around, but man, it, you know, it's pretty dense with homes in there. So if you go down to the street here, and you'll see her in a second. I think that's actually the camera right there, actually, that's uh, filming it. The street view is from August 2021. So uh, this was would have been 2017, but obviously that doesn't look like a ring doorbell camera. That's an actual security, you know, like a high-end camera. So here's the footage right here. Now, it's interesting because the guy um, forgot what that's called, but when you have nerve damage in your leg and your foot flops up sometimes for a while after a surgery. Like they say, his right foot's doing that. I can kind of see what they're saying. Why isn't it playing? Wow, 
Something really bizarre going on here. <laughs> wow, that's absolutely crazy. You can see my... Uh, let me zoom in. Yeah, look how, look how weird that is. It's like shooting all over the place for no reason. I think I have to manually move it. So there he is walking by. And you can see there's a fire hydrant and then the tree right there. And there's the fire hydrant, the tree with more leaves on it. And so he's walking by right here. And it's sort of weird, the... You know, if he was, they, I think they really think that that guy is associated with it. So he, if you were going to walk there on streets, it's kind of a long walk because um, I'm not even sure that, you know, unless you were really aware of local stuff, you know, like, like local shortcuts and shit, like right there that you could walk on through this little path here. You know, uh, if you walked on the street, You'd actually have to go from the quickest route is from this house like this up to here and then over here and then down and then around and then you'd be seen right there. If you knew the area, you could walk like this and then go right through this uh, temple here and then like that and down. Okay, if you knew the area, so it's a lot shorter if you know the area and you can go like that. If you don't know it, you're walking around on all kinds of crazy streets up in here and then finally make it over to there. Let me, I'm going to shut this down and then open it back up again. I'm not sure why it's, that was really strange. <clears throat> no, they don't know who the man is. That's why they're showing the surveillance footage. If they knew who he was, they probably wouldn't even be playing it. They'd be using it at trial. It's in Toronto, Canada. As opposed to Toronto, Oregon, for example. I think after this uh, this next article is going to be almost Apple time. I'm going to open this up. Tarana? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's what they're saying. Yeah, drop foot was what it's called, yeah. All right, let's see if this works. Ah, there we go. Not sure what the hell was going on a minute ago. So there he is. His right foot. I don't know if I necessarily see what they're seeing, but... Let's see. I'll do it frame by frame once he gets... And I'll make it bigger. Let me zoom in on the... There we go. Come on. Here it comes. Oh, maybe because that right foot, it, the, it, after lifting up, it goes down really fast, I think. Let's see. Although I don't really see much different on the next one. All right, so the toe goes way up in the air and down. And then this foot, the toe doesn't point up like that, that one does. And it doesn't do it on any of them. See that one points, see how it's like straight out, toes at a 45 degree angle to the ground, right? 
And the next foot doesn't do that any anywhere near that. Well, I guess right there it's sort of like that, but it goes down. I guess I'd have to know what. Uh, let's see what it is. Now that doesn't seem like that's how he's walking. I don't see that. Looks like a narcissist. Give me a break. <laughs> anybody that get, anybody has a chance to use that, they throw it out. Oh, he's a narcissist! Foot drop, sometimes called drop foot, refers to difficulty lifting the front part of your foot often causing your foot to drag across the ground when you walk. It is usually diagnosed during a physical exam. Your doctor will watch you walk and check your leg muscles huh. for weakness. He or she may also check for numbness on your heels. If this is difficult, foot muscles that control dorsiflexion are a different part of your foot, often causing your foot to drag across the ground when you walk. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that's what we're looking for then. Yeah, I think he does look kind of just normal. <laughs> I agree, Mac. I was just kind of thinking that myself. You know, after I was looking at it, well, no, both feet do the 45. It looks kind of normal. It's like, people are always looking for something. You know, like in the Delphi, you get two seconds. Oh, my God! He's had a, a hip replacement. You know, it just goes on and on and on. It never ends. Here, here's what we can do. We can zoom put it over here where he starts coming in see this is this is what's cool uh, what you can do uh, th you set these keyframes when you're editing a video right and then he moves by let's say he goes way over here now you pan it over after you've already set the other keyframe you catch up to him and he's right there for example and now when this video plays once he shows up on the scene right there it'll start moving with him watch so you can see him the whole time. He might be a little too fast. Yeah. And then it'll kind of go with him a little bit more. Yeah, he's on a bridge and he's clomping over stuff. It's only two seconds, too. You can't tell anything in two seconds of video. Unless he was like missing a leg, you know, then at that point it might be. Yeah, let's try that one. Yeah, I think it, I think it looks more normal than anything. I mean, just watching those two drop foot examples, I don't see any of that at all. I mean, he's even walking on like icy ground and he's doing okay. Yeah, yeah, they went overboard, and I bet you it has nothing to do with anything. Yeah, but anyways, if you recognize this guy, whoever that is. <laughs> I mean, see, that's what I'm saying. See, here's what a lot of people do. They'll zoom in on that, right? Oh, you can see, oh, oh, look at that, oh. You know, this is what you'll get on the uh, digital DNA channels, okay? You'll get the, uh, let's see, where do we go here? Right there. Oh, look, at there's a dot there. That's one big, big eyeball, and there's another huge eyeball right there, and that's his nose. He actually looks a little bit like, uh, remember watching Saturday Night Live years ago? There was that little clay character. Uh, what was his name? And they would squish it every time. He'd say like, oh no, that kind of thing. You guys remember that one, right? Yeah, Mr. Bill. Okay, let me, let me type that in. 
Well, you tell me that isn't Mr. Bill right there. Look it. <laughs> God, that actually, that does look like, look at Mr. Bill and then the big eye and right there. And he's even got the same haircut. I think we've just nailed it, everybody. We have just nailed it. We have just now figured out that the killer is Mr. Bill. I know it sounds strange, uh, but we just proved it. There he is. <laughs> Absolutely nailed it, you guys. Yeah, they keep pointing at the, the... What they're pointing at is the right foot, how it does seem to swing up slightly higher, like it's going to clomp down. See that? Like slap, 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 slap. But, it, but um, those examples they had aren't quite... You know, if drop foot doesn't look like that. I don't know. To me, it's... Um, I agree with what Mag was saying. It looks more like in the more normally range. But uh, if you look at it, you know, maybe if you were just to look at it and it seems like it does sort of come up and flop down more than the other foot. See how it sort of... But one thing we're not really paying attention to is that his right foot has the white background, so it's really noticeable. So your mind might go, oh, wow, look how his right foot's doing that. You see, because you can see it with the white bat. See, watch what I'm saying here. He's walking on a dark path. His left foot never really makes it into the white, but you can see his foot. Foot. Foot, right? And now it look, both look normal, and then you see his right foot again come above the snow, so it makes it, his right foot look like it's doing something different when it could be that if he, if he had the camera on the other side of the street, his left foot would be going into the white looking like that yeah so that's the video that he's referring to in this article right here the mysterious murder suspect with the odd walking style has been on the radar of Toronto police since shortly after the bodies of Honey and Barry Sherman were discovered four years ago recently unsealed search warrant Documents reveal multiple images of the unknown person trudging in heavy boots. What happened? Beholder. Oh, wow. What's going on? Did you, like... Oh, it's the join button. Yes, you too, everybody. For all of those with the names that are dimmed in the very unattractive gray color, um, although my name uh, shouldn't be equated with that, is that the uh, you need to join the channel, right? Then you have access to all the crazy emojis. One of these days, I'll just make a video that'll just describe each of the emojis. And uh, that way, when you join the channel, you can just watch that and understand what they all mean. Okay? They don't all mean... Gray, you're so mean! Yeah, I know. That's I always, that's what I always think, too. When, you know, they apparently have studied it over and over and over again, but I think they're being sort of, their eyes are being tricked by the fact that the right foot has a white backdrop where you can really see it, and it makes them believe that his right foot's flipping up because, boy, you can't see it on the other one. We don't know. Hey, see, uh, why do you do that, LM? Can I ask you why you do that? Ellen, why do you why do you make comments like that? It's almost like you're bipolar at some points. It's just absolutely wild when you type stuff like that in. You know, we we were all goofing around earlier, joking around, and then something triggers your mind and you go south really quick. Okay, but we'll everything will be just fine tomorrow. Though, okay. I've been about drop beers. Hey, thanks, Sooner History. We, we all love you, LM. Don't worry about it. Everything will be just fine. <laughs> God, it's so unbelievable. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's so weird. Like she's just sitting around seething instead of just joining in on the show again. And nobody even said anything. It was just that she had to jump in with the, you know, feeling so sorry for Lynette who didn't need anybody feeling sorry because we goof around all the time. And that was it. And then, you know, I'm not going to explain myself. She always derails the show with their shitty comments. So we'll just continue on. All right. Uh, yet police sat on all this information, unable to identify the person until last week when they asked for public assistance, officially labeling this person as a suspect. And so he's a suspect in the case. They are finally asking for the public's health, uh, help after four years. Another, I think, absolutely stupid time to wait because back then somebody might have said oh wow I remember seeing that person walk by no it doesn't validate anything LM you come on here and you act like a troll some nights and nobody knows why it's very strange it doesn't validate anything it's me talking to somebody who's trolling the channel okay you do it often you just out of nowhere you attack and then the next day you're normal again Okay, you've even called in in your normal. So I'm wondering where your, how your brain goes from something to something else. Very strange, okay? Very strange. But love having you here. Just hate when you make, when you do those types of comments derailing the show, almost like you're attention seeking. It's very odd. Very odd indeed. All right, uh, let's see. Meanwhile, the newly released documents also show that in the early days of their probe, police conducted a test to see if the Sherman home phone number was capable of calling 911. Police refused to say whether, at, at, as some have suggested, there was a 911 call from the Sherman home the night of the murder or another occasion that was somehow missed. Yeah. Investigators are trying to determine if this person is a potential witness or suspect of the murders. Um, let's see. Police found it suspicious that, that this person caught on multiple video cameras was why well we need to get the rest of the video too. Put it all together in a movie and timeline. The person the video shows moves from east to west, walking at least two kilometers. And so he must have walked the the long way that I was showing because if you go up in, oops. That again. No, no, I, I don't, LM. That, that's the difference between you and everybody else. Nobody treats you bad at all. And so you're what you're doing, LM, it's almost like you're a troll account because you're trying to... Um, join in on all the bashing okay because you want to be liked over there okay you go do what you want to go do lm i'm not going to keep dealing with your your crap when you do these weird sort of bipolar moments that you have it's very strange that we have to address that kind of stuff all the time very strange yeah and it does because what she's doing is she's trying to give ammunition to the troll channels that all they do and it's really sick to do that okay so pretty soon you'll just be removed from the channel permanently because I can't deal with that okay I, I it's just you know you, you seem like you have like a hateful heart to be to say shit like that during a show there's no reason for it it's embarrassing for you Ridiculous. All right, so let me let me just measure this right here, and uh, we we'll get the this right here. Dad, how come I can't grab it? So if it's right here, and you walk this, let me get the kilometers on here, like that. Then across, up, boom, boom, down, here, up, and then right there. And that turns out, that's 1.2 kilometers. 
So that means the person took even a longer route if they say the person walked two kilometers. Because that's the quickest route, and that's even kind of, oh, look, for walking. Hmm. See, I'd like to know where the other cameras were. Then we could put it all together, because that definitely isn't two kilometers. Chewbacca? Chewbacca? Oh, proud hey. to be a freak and proud to be a part of Grace Freak family. Well, thanks, Mac. I hope everybody feels that way that are here. I mean, I'm just me, and most most people in here don't get, they're not so thick-skinned that if you say something like, don't worry about it, you know, you don't need to say, we love you to somebody because you think that somebody's being mean to them when it's not because you don't know the situation then it's just it gets really weird you know it's weird for me i just want to you know sometimes it just makes me want to just bail on the whole thing you know because i'm sitting here trying to do a complicated case here and i um, i just don't have time to deal with that shit <laughs> well thanks bad mojo Well, because I think that is. Um, have you been? Have you been here, Brussels sprouts? She does this like once every week or something. Out of nowhere, she just starts trashing the channel, and nobody said a word to her. Okay, so you you haven't been here, Brussels sprouts. All right, so this isn't something new. It, it's it's a weird phenomenon. I don't know if she has that or what, but it's very strange. I wish you guys would, if you noticed what I'm saying, you would see what the, I mean, many people sitting here right now have seen it a million times, okay? So, okay, then you haven't seen it then. So don't try to pretend that you know what's going on and make your little comment, all right? Because you have not been here, you have not seen it. It happens a lot with one person and it happens regularly at a, almost a, a similar interval No, that's not what they were saying. I think that might be a real thing. But it's like, that's what she's doing. That's not, ah, oh, jeez. Now we got more people bashing the, all right, anyway, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do it, I'll do the show a different night. Okay, we'll get to the next half. We'll have to just put this one on, uh, I'll just put it on uh, members only or something and call it good. God. No, don't don't worry, LM. I'm not gonna block you. But can you just quit doing the crap that you do? It's unbelievable. God, it's just really sad. No bail for you from jail or from the show. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's where I'm going then. Because that's no bail minus twenty. Yeah, I'd like to hear the show too. Well, just kind of the way it is because it ruins my the mood that for me doing you know like you got to be kind of in or into it now, but now it just sort of creeps in the back of your mind. Yeah, but why is it? Why is a member trolling? It's like she does this every other week or something. Everything's great. Everything's great, and then out of nowhere, troll, troll. Then everything's great. Everything's great. Troll, troll, troll. Hey, look at I got a baconator. But that's still minus twenty-five. I guess so, so, so. I guess we just have to accept it as being part of it. But it's the things she say that she says that are so shitty. Yeah.
Hey, thank you, Tracy Nixon. Maybe we're minus, t we're 10 out now. I got the Burger Baconator. Love those. Tracy Nixon. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to it, but I, I got put in prison, too, so. Oh, there we go. We're out now. Yeah. Thanks, Carolina T. I, <laughs> I don't know where that it comes from. It's just such a bizarre thing. And I think that's sort of what adds to the trolls out there. Did you see Gray on there? He was, you know, it's just, it wasn't like that at all. But that's what they say. And it's just crazy. Right? Crazy times. Hey, thanks, your gypsy. Billy Juliana got me the hell out of there. And uh, Rhea Mazarone. All right, you can be processed now. <laughs> Proceed now. Get out of jail card by Rhea Mazarone and Candle Lee Woodward Stone. Oh, there we go. Gray, I'm sorry you have to deal with this. <laughs> Chris Watts, no way, man. All right, let me just, let me just. Let me do some of my Amaste, or Namaste for a second. All right, you can proceed now. Oh, look at the dog. Here comes the hug, everybody. It's really tiny, but you see Chloe go up and just hug Blue. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me let me do it. Um. Um. <laughs> No, it's not how it works, Pamela B. Yeah. Get out of jail. I got put in jail. See, here we go. Look at here we go with the trolls, everybody. Here we go with the trolls. So here we go. Troll Central coming up. Please continue. I was watching intensely. Yeah. Ty. Maybe that maybe that's where it comes down to. Just turn the chat off for the shows. Maybe you'd make it uh, for Oogla Boogla Freaks and Higher, something like that, and then maybe there's a better chance. To get through a show without having the Pamela Bees of the world. Uh, she didn't pay attention. That isn't what was going on. I, I, I would obviously I would keep doing the show, but I, I just got really frustrated for a minute, you know. But then I was tossed in prison, and so that's how it works over here. That's part of the how the you know we, you know, the channel raises funds every single night, and then during the weeks and months we donate money. Um, like last month, four thousand dollars. I'm just kidding, Dan. I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I guess it is Sunday. I, never, I didn't even know. I thought it was like Tuesday or something earlier. All right, you guys ready? I hardly ever say anything because I love to listen. Future bail. She, she's not deleted, Pamela. She's not deleted. See, Pamela, you're just acting like a troll in here because that isn't what happened. <laughs> oh, my God. Quit belly aching. Here we go. See, that makes me just not want to do it. You know, it's just... Uh, my channel and charities, Pamela B. Yeah. Have you not been around, Pamela? Hey, Pamela. For example, did you did you know that uh, last year we donated forty five thousand dollars to charity on this channel? Uh, how much did your favorite channel donate? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, uh, the year before twenty two thousand, so it goes up every time. They're they're not deleted. I'm sa I'm sitting right here, Pamela. You're full of crap. Okay. <clears throat> Well, it, it sort of makes me laugh, Lynette, but we got another troll on the, on the prowl. Yeah. So, Pamela B., how much did your favorite YouTube channel donate to charities? I'm just, I'm just curious, you know. Go ahead. Give me a number. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. So, thanks for questioning. I, and I show every single donation on the screen, and every single person who is a channel member here and donates to the channel knows that I donate about 50% of the net income from YouTube and the rest goes to help supporting my channel 
and keeping me able to do what I'm doing every single night. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he donates all the time, but he doesn't. He, uh, <laughs> all right, Pamela. You know, you're just a, you're just an absolute troll. I'm sure. Huh? You've donated a thousand and four. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Ellen. Appreciate it. I'm not deleting anything. I'm just sitting here, having to defend myself from trolls. <laughs> okay. See, now Pamela is doing the passive aggressive thing. Why are you so defensive? I just ask, what are you, you know, that isn't what you're doing, Pamela. Everybody knows that you came in here, you're attacking, and you're asking that question to be, you're doing a passive aggressive attack. It's absolutely obvious. There isn't anybody in here that does, doesn't get it. All right? <laughs> God. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. They, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, the gas lighters. Yeah, tonight's a weird night, man. Just doing a regular show. Yeah, it was a good show until right now. I think these people have a disease of some sort. It's really wild. Trollitis. <laughs> God, that was good. All right, anyways, let me get back to this. Is this the one on the 20th? You need the one on the 20th. There it is. Just the one. Damage. Yeah, there we go. Uh, police found it suspicious that this person caught on multiple video cameras was walking in the neighborhood between 9 p.m. and midnight. And see, they remember the murders were, they got home at 8.30 and could have happened right around then. Then all of a sudden, 9 p.m. and midnight, the time when police say the Shermans were killed. But why is he walking around so much? Maybe they see him walking to the house and then later leaving but it'd be weird if he was he left the house at nine and then he's seen walking still at midnight when it was only a two kilometer walk to get back to where you know where he's seen on that surveillance footage do you have the answers for that one Lynette the, um, the person the video show moves from east to west wow <laughs> what are you doing, Chloe? Uh oh, Chloe's going nuts again, everybody. Person as police have revealed spends a suspicious amount of time in an area near Sherman's home. Wow. Person the video moves from east to west walking at least two kilometers and they'll then until the person comes to a point tight to the Sherman's home. The person, as police have revealed, spends a suspicious amount of time in the... Oh, okay, that's what he is. So they got him coming and going in an area near the Sherman's home that is not covered by any of the neighborhood home security cameras. Then the person leaves the same way the person arrived, heading east. Oh, there it is. Look at that. The lone video police revealed to the public Shows the person walking 1.3 kilometers. Oh, my God. <laughs> Look at that. That's exactly what we had here. Hold on. Let me do that again. So right here. One, two, three, boom, boom. So this person isn't from the neighborhood. They could have made it. There's a whole bunch of shortcuts they could have taken. And right there to here. And then boom, 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 boom. And that comes out to 1.29 kilometers. Can I get a boom? I think that's the exact walk. Right there. Hmm. 
Hmm. And that's to me that indicates this person doesn't know the neighborhood. Because if they did, they could have walked like this and just cut right across like that. Instead, they so they must have been here around nine o'clock. So the Shermans had got home. But it's interesting because they're wearing jackets, which indicates that somebody was at least there near the time that they got home, perhaps, unless they were used for, um, like one article mentioned, for controlling the movements of their arms and so forth. Yeah, well, I think he must have wasn't dropped off by a vehicle. I think he walked from, you know, maybe over, well, who knows? I mean... He might have his own vehicle, but he parked it in a place. I want to know how far they have him continually walking. They probably use this one just as one of the clips that they have, but did he keep moving? You know, obviously he would have kept walking, so there's got to be more homes over here that have him on camera. And then where was the last known sighting? Does he make it into this industrial area over here? at which almost all these buildings have security cameras on them. So maybe he parked on the edge over here by, uh, like, Leslie Street, walks there, and then boom, he's on a freeway, and there's no cameras at all. Although Canada, I think, has CCTV, stuff like that. I don't think he would have gone to a, a parking lot. The detective presented, uh, let's see, by obtaining transmission and tracking data from the phone numbers subject to his application, investigators hope to identify the unknown person. Fourth timeline prepared by police back in 2018 describes the consolidated timeline for the known movement of Honey Sherman, Bernard Sherman, and the unknown person on December 13th. Police have maintained that the seal on all of this information and the star will argue in court. Ooh, that'd be pretty sweet to get that. When one video of the mystery person was made public last week, Detective Sergeant Brandon Price of the Homicide Squad said they chose to release the video because it provided the clearest images. Police said they do not even know if, if it is a man or a woman, but have determined the person's height is between 5'6", and three quarters. What the? How could you know that? His height is between five foot six and three quarters. I mean, that is so specific. And five feet nine and a half. <laughs> how in the hell would you get that kind of detail? Five six and three quarters. And five nine and a half. Why not just say between five seven and five ten? Man, if you if you if you're that precise where you can say he's between five, six and three quarters, then you then you have the technology to know that he's five, six and three quarters, right? Don't you think? <laughs> I mean it's like you, you would know that he was exactly that height if you are that precise when he's walking. That's that's crazy. The newly released document also includes a heavily redacted section dealing with a test they conducted of the ability of the Sherman's home telephone to dial 911. Hmm. Why wouldn't it be able to do that, I guess, would be a question. Okay, then there's another article here on December 20th. This is by uh, the, uh, the Two-Way, I guess it's called. Days after Barry and Honey Sherman were found strangled in their basement, police are investigating what they call their suspicious deaths. The case has sparked speculation and debate in Canada where the billionaire couple were famous both for their ties to the uh, 
pharmaceutical company Apotex and for their philanthropy. So this is an old article right here. I think we already went over that one. I think it got uh, knocked back up into the 2021 area on accident. All right, here we go. This one is from, this also says December 22nd, 2017. Hold on. I want the 2021 articles. There we go. This one is December 23rd, 2021. And apparently, oh yeah, this is the star. I can't get into this one. But I think I might have have it sitting right here. So hold on. So 12-23-2021. Yeah, thanks to Lynette Burns. Okay, one year into the Barry and Honey Sherman murder investigation, a bombshell. Toronto police believed it was possible the murder or murderers were stalking the billionaire couple a month or more before they were killed, search warrant documents reveal. But police were struggling. A Toronto judge was repeatedly denying their request to track by cellular telephone transmission the whereabouts at the time of the murders of 35 individuals who were persons of interest. This information comes from documents released in court following a four-year challenge by the Star. These newly released documents also provide insight into the 36-hour time period after the Shermans were killed. More than a thousand pages, a collection of police interviews and theories have been released to the Star in the last week in five batches. Each is an information to obtain, ITO, a lengthy affidavit prepared by Toronto Homicide. Uh, detective uh, something like maybe Constable Dennis Yim in attempt to get a court to grant access to cellular telephone transmission and tracking data. Yim second to the homicide unit the week after the bodies were discovered has for the last four years been tasked with making these requests. Uh, Barry and Honey Sherman were found dead in their old Colony Road home on Friday December 13th 2017, they were in a seated position in their basement swimming pool room facing a wall. Each had a man's leather belt looped around their neck and tied to a railing three feet just under a meter above the pool deck, the documents reveal. One document provides for the first time confirmation that Barry's wrists had been tied. Pathologists, so they're, you know, when you see that they were tied up like that, that means that there was probably um, a long period of time when they were alive in that house because you would think somebody would just come in and kill them. But there must have been a period of time when they were alive. Maybe they were trying to get something from them. The documents also reveal that police searched the sewer system around Old Colony Road in an apparent attempt to find out if whatever was used to tie the wrist was flushed down a toilet. Pathologists made the determination that Barry was restrained by both looking at red marks circling Barry's wrist. See, that's the thing. Oh, there you go. So his hands were tied. Then he was killed. And then the person actually removed whatever was tied around him. And they think maybe he threw that down the drain. Right. So that means that uh, he was tied up, killed, and then the person didn't want that uh, the material used to tie his hands to be recovered. Maybe that would have led to him. So that's yeah, that's pretty interesting. Hmm. That revelation by Dr. David Shiasen, a top pathologist hired by the Sherman family, tipped the scales for the early theory that Barry killed Honey. They took, uh, then took his own life. Now, why would he tie his wrist like that? That they were both murdered. Honey had a small red mark on her right eye, as the star has previously reported. What is clear, now while this is, uh, where is that part? What is clear from these new documents is that while police interview friends, family, work colleagues, and 
staff at the Sherman home in the first few months of the probe, 250 people in total by the end of the first year. The interviews were all but over and the case had become a data investigation. While this was going on, one person police had previously interviewed came forward with new information. This is described starkly in one ITO as new information, but the pages the star has obtained from court are completely redacted. This new information appears to have led police to pursue the theory that someone or some people were watching Honey and Barry before the murders. Hmm. Maybe they have surveillance of a car down the street, something like that. A Justice Pringle heard three different applications from Yim between June and December 2018. He provided the numbers and the telephone providers. Uh, there was some concern with losing data if the requests were not approved. While Bell and Rogers keep all data for at least a year, tell us deletes texting data after 150 days. Hmm. Rogers, the, uh, let's see, the document shows keeps its data for 13 months and Yim's December application 12 months after the murders. Yim said he feared the data could be lost forever. Three times from June to November, Pringle was asked to approve applications. Uh, let's see. Documents also include statements from business colleagues, including Alex Glassenberg, who runs Barry's holding company, and who told police that he had been advising Barry to sell Apotex, but Barry said he would hold on for five more years. Jim went back to court in December with a different tactic, still seeking permission for the tracking data for about two dozen phones. Pringle had been holding him to a high standard, insisting that police provide reasonable grounds to believe that the tracking data would provide evidence of murder. Looking at all these applications, it is clear that the police were looking for the following uh, proof that one or more of these 35 people were following the Shermans around for a month or more, were near Old Colony Road the night of the murders. See, that would be interesting to track them for a month and see if some of these people were in the same areas as, uh, you know, the Shermans, even if it was un unknown to them. Like, let's say the Shermans over at a, at a restaurant where they parked nearby watching. Did they continue to follow the Shermans when they went home on other occasions? And then finally got, you know, figured out their routine and then executed a plan you know, where they would park when they normally came home. Looking at all these applications, it is clear that the police were looking for the following proof that one of, of more of those 35 people were following the Shermans around for a month or more, were near Old Colony Road the night of the murders, or were communicating with the unknown suspect. With the odd walk that police long believed was either the killer or lookout for the killer. Hmm. Well, that definitely could be what he was. That makes sense. Yeah, but that would mean he had a cell phone, but if it was a burner, which he would have used. Okay, so that's the thing. If he was a lookout, he would have used a burner phone, and those are the ones that I, apparently they can't track or something, or it doesn't lead to a person. Um, and maybe they even have a phone that was in the area, and but it just isn't one that they can track to a person. You know what they should have is burner phones should have a serial number associated with them, even if it doesn't put a name, but then it should be able to be determined where the phone was purchased from, and then maybe you should be able to go then find the camera at the place that they were purchased during the time that the phone with that serial number was, was bought. What do you think of that? It probably doesn't have that, though. Probably just a number. And... I I hate Brussels sprouts too. I just finally realized realized what your name meant. <laughs> wait, no, wait. Yeah, you hate. Okay. 
I'm glad you don't have the H there. Because if you said you ate them, I'd be like, oh, yikes. Yeah. The star does not yet know if the December 2018 application by police was successful. Uh, <coughs> the new documents also reveal the attempt, attempted communication directed at Sherman friends and family at the time when the Shermans were already dead. The document did not explain why they are included. Police said Barry and Honey were dead by midnight Wednesday, December 13th because that's when they see that guy Hmm. So they, they probably had him alive for a while then. Their phone and email records, those are not redacted reveal. Hmm. On that went, wow, that's weird. So police have said Barry and Honey were dead by midnight. Their phone and email records, those that are not redacted reveal. Hmm. Well, who's they, the police? On that Wednesday night, Barry sent his last known email at 8.23 to his second-in-command at approximately, I mean, at Ap Apotex at one of his, uh, and one of his best friends, Jack Kay. Kay, who was in New York with his wife seeing a concert, responded back at 9.48 p.m. No, so he responded back at 9.48 p.m. Kay told police it was such a routine email he sent that it was not su that he was not surprised Barry did not respond. Okay, so the we don't get to know what the response was. Thursday at 5:34 p.m., Barry and Honey's son Jonathan, who had returned Monday from a trip to Japan with his husband Fred uh, McCure, emailed Barry to invite him to a holiday dinner the next week on December 18th. The dinner was billed as the Green Storage Christmas Party Dinner. Green Storage is a company owned by Jonathan and his business partner, Adam Pollan, funded by Barry. But isn't that the one that collapsed after a while? Sherman, daughter of Alexander Krasik, emailed uh, Honey and Barry on Friday, December 15th at 10.06 a.m. So that's the day they were killed. Reminding them of a planned dinner that evening. We're looking forward to celebrating Hanukkah with Grandma and Grandpa tonight. Please come early as usual to spend more time with the kid, kiddos. I will be home with Derek by around 5 p.m. Shortly after a series of calls to Barry Blackberry, Kaylin, the youngest Sherman daughter, calls twice at 10.16 and 10.18. Lauren, the eldest Sherman child, who was in Mexico on vacation, also called Barry at 10.18. Then at 11 a.m., Jeremy... I mean, some of this stuff doesn't seem to be... I'd, I'd rather get to this later stuff. At 4.34 p.m. on Friday, several hours after Sherman's children, Jonathan and Alexandra, have told the star they notified their sister, Lauren, in Mexico... Barry's phone records, a text message from Lauren. Hi, Dad. My car was broken into, and I'm not sure how to deal with it from here. Well, that's kind of interesting. Can you help me wrap, uh, can you help me wrap my rap mind around what to do? While not outlined in the unredacted part of the document, Lauren was in Mexico and may have had an issue with her car in Whistler, B.C., where she lives. Hmm. Uh, the final communication police note on the phone comes at 8.27 p.m. on Friday, long after the bodies were discovered. That's weird because it's almost the exact time as that. That was 8.23 the day before. From Mark Winter, a distant relative. Oh, yeah, so these do matter here. These are text messages, I think, on the day, no, it's Thursday, 
And this is Friday the 15th. But that's the day that they were killed. So, I was thinking maybe that was the 16th. Can you help me wrap my mind around what to do? While not outlined in the unredacted part of the document, Lauren was in Mexico and may have had an issue with her car in Whistler, B.C. The final communication police note on the phone comes at 8.27 p.m. on Friday, long after the bodies were discovered, from Mark Winter, a distant relative of Barry, on his mother Sarah's side. Barry, it's Mark Winter. Are you and your family okay? I just saw on the news something scary. Mark is also related to Carrie Winter, Barry's cousin, who was un unsuccessfully sued Barry for part ownership of Apotec. So that guy, huh. So his family members, one of, you know, a relative actually sued him for part ownership. Hmm. Yeah. This one definitely seems like it's about money. Yeah, there's the video again. What's unsuccessful? -y? What is that? Never heard that word before, Pamela. Yeah, greed. This is the greed. Yeah, but there's so many people you could maybe think or had something to do with it. There's another one by Donovan on the 27th, pretty recently. Wow, we're we're learning we're learning new words on here tonight. Unsuccessful key. This one's on the 27th. Now, the Toronto Star has won access in court to police investigative documents in the now four year old unsolved case of Barry and Honey Sherman's murder. Last week, we detailed the results of the first year of the homicide probe and how intensive interviews with Sher uh, Sherman's family, friends, and business associates led detectives to check 35 cellular telephones. Okay. If you were on the streets around the Toronto home of murder victim Barry and Honey Sherman on July 25, 2018, you would have seen a youngish-looking Toronto police officer making a series of calls on a cell phone then uh, methodically recording the results in a notebook. That was Detective Constable Dennis uh, Yim of the Toronto Police Homicide Unit. Yim made the same series of test calls from the parking lot of Apotex, the generic drug company founded by Barry and grown into a multi-billion dollar enterprise. Yim was setting the table for a new kind of search seeking an electronic needle in a haystack. It would lead to a request in early 2019 for what is known in cell phone terms as a tower dump. There we go. They did the tower dump. By the end of 2018, one year into the case, police knew that Barry and Honey were murdered between 9 p.m. and midnight on Wednesday, December 13, 2017. They knew Barry was tied at the wrist before he died. They knew both Shermans were strangled with a thin ligature of some sort and restrained in a seated position by belts looped around their necks and attached. So it's almost like they were just made to look like that's how they killed themselves, but they had already been killed a different way. So they were put that way. That's right. That, that says that next. Their neck and attached to a low railing surrounding their basement swimming pool room after they were dead. Honey had been struck in the face, leaving a small mark on her right eye. Both were we wearing their shoes. 
and as the documents reveal, police were asking Sherman family and friends if it was the couple's habit to take off their shoes when they came home. When police did not know, did not know who, uh, I think it was supposed to be who was, uh, no was who killed. I think it was supposed to be who was killed. The Shermans, though, fam, uh, though family and friends were quick to point fingers at business colleagues. Hmm. Of Barry's suggestions that police documents show went nowhere. But what police did have was a series of images of an unknown person. While police, in a press conference this month, said they did not know if the person was male or female. Well, looks like a male to me. The newly released documents clearly identify the individual as male. Right. And the new documents show that the image the public saw, a short video clip of the unknown man, was an odd has an odd gait in hopes the public could make an identification. In the last image they have caught 1.3 kilometers east of the Sherman's home in North York. So that would, that would have been a good way for um, Lynette to have figured it out. You just walk the routes and go 1.3 miles and boom. After this image, the unknown male was not seen on video anywhere else as there was no other known video available and other locations with the video had already been overwritten. The unknown male was not seen on video anywhere else as there was no other known video available and other locations with video had already been... Oh man, so they didn't check that. The police documents show. Uh, police say they have other video that shows the individual approaching the Sherman home. That's what I was wondering earlier because they said 9 to 12. So there you go. Have other video that shows the individual approaching the Sherman home, disappearing from any cameras in the area, then reappearing and walking away from the home. Police say the person spent a suspicious amount of time near the Sherman's home on Old Colony Road. Following multiple ITO requests in court, not all successful because police did not have appropriate grounds for requests. Uh, that's when they're, they're trying to get do the data dumps and everything. When cellular telephone is used to make a call or receive a text, it communicates with a cellular tower in the area creating a handshake according to Yim's request. This data is specific to an area. Think of drawing an invisible electronic box around a property or section of street. When Yim, in the summer of 2018, was walking around the neighborhood making calls on a Toronto police-issued cellular phone, he was looking to create handshakes in various areas to help with the tower dump. Some locations were at the Sherman's address, some at a home across the road. Interesting. So they're really trying to dial that in. I don't know. That's crazy, Mag, that they waited so long. The explanation is given for this in the documents. Some of the route where the unknown man was spotted and some were at Apotex, where Barry and Honey were before heading home the day they died. Yim was asking for a tower dump so he could find any unknown devices in those areas that night and then see what other devices they were communicating with. The request was to be made, let's see, Yim was asking to find any unknown devices in those areas that might and then see what other devices they were communicating with. Hmm. Police would then compare the results of the tower dump to the 35 numbers Yim had amassed. Should police find numbers associated with so-called burner phones, prepaid phones not associated with an easily identified individual, police would then have to try to learn the cell phone user's identity through other means. Hey, there you go, that's what I was saying. So maybe there's a way that you can figure out where that who sold a phone that had that phone number on it. I mean, you know, what company sold the burner phone that had the phone number that they found. And then you could find, okay, it was sold at 7-Eleven 
on you know a Tuesday. This is kind of what I was saying a few minutes ago. Sold at a Seven Eleven a month earlier. You know whatever. And then hopefully they can they could go there and retrieve any footage that they might have had during the time and date that that phone was purchased. So there you go. Wow, that was cool. Uh, an actual just random thought turned out to be what what they were doing. <clears throat> to make the new request pal uh, palatable to Pringle, police stressed that the data from the tower dumps would be kept in password protected files and accessed by members of the police intelligence unit. Those officers would then assess the data and only pass on information pertinent to the Sherman probe. The problem with this request being made 13 months into the probe, yeah, there's not going to be no surveillance when they go to the 7-Eleven, was that some of the data was already lost. For example, some cell phone providers delete texting data after between I think that's a huge problem though because if they're doing this 13 months later trying to track out who uh, track down who bought it and a picture of their face well I mean who knows how long I mean I think you know what two weeks usually at a business yeah I don't even read any of these <laughs> I just put them all in order and go through it because I want to I don't want to be you know it's boring if you read them twice, right? Like, so we're just kind of in, you know, mapping things out and, and investigating at the same time, trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I, mean, I might see the title, you know. Police feared that more data would be lost if this new request was not approved. The documents the star has obtained so far do not show if the tower dump request was successful. These documents confirm that, as the star is reported, Toronto police had all but completely stopped conducting the interviews by the end of the first year. An extensive canvas of the neighborhood was fail has failed to reveal any person who could provide compelling information in relation to the deaths. Uh, the star has spoken to people on the Sherman Street who were never shown images of, for example, the mysterious man police believe murdered the Shermans. Those neighbors expressed surprise that police did not approach them. Yeah, see how stupid that is? God. You show them, and, you know, two days later you show it to them and they're like, oh my god, yeah, I saw that guy. He was he was smoking a cigarette next to that building. Well, shit, there's a cigarette butt. For example, and this is before DNA, right? I mean, the not before DNA, but before genetic genealogy was used. So, People that back then would just toss a cigarette down. They wouldn't even, you know, as long as they weren't in the system somewhere, they wouldn't care. Well, he couldn't have smoked a cigarette. He's got drop foot. Yeah, that's the kind of logic you get sometimes. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of strangeness here in this story. For example, police have entirely redacted tech. Let's see. Many of the documents released to the Star, more than a thousand pages in the past 10 days, are heavily redacted, making it difficult to get a complete picture of the investigation as it unfolded. I hate redaction. Put a one if you hate redactions. <laughs> For example, police have entire, entirely redacted text from a 2011 Court of Appeal for Ontario decision in which Justice David Watt explained how cellular phone tower dumps were used in a robbery investigation. The text included by police to support their application for Sherman tower dump. Oh, well, there you go. Everybody puts one. It is available to the public on legal in a legal database. One is this? This is like 2019. Uh, your book review. Oh, so this might be interesting because it's uh, who killed Barry Honey Sherman? A new book, and I think that the book is by Kevin Donovan right there. And these are questions here. 
Should I have Mary Lou read the question? Your book reveals that the... I don't think so. Yeah, your book reveals that Toronto police weren't contacted for almost 90 minutes after the Sherman's bodies were found next to their indoor swimming pool. Is that kind of delay usual in your experience? It's very unusual, and I was fixated on it for some time. As far as I can tell, the bodies are discovered, some phone calls were made, and the people who made the phone calls don't want to describe to me why they did not did what they did. The police are adamant they got their call at 11.44 a.m. All by research, uh, all my research indicates the bodies were found at 10.10 a.m. Hmm. Yeah, you wonder what was going on in that meantime, in the meantime there, right? Uh, Toronto police never said publicly that they believe the case was a murder-suicide, though they talked about no force entry and no search for suspects. You write that police sources continued to tell reporters privately that murder-suicide was the working theory which inflamed the Sherman's family and friends. Yet there were also reports that both Barry and Honey Sherman were found with their coats pulled back behind them. Okay, I see what, I see what, what that means. So the, were they made to put their coats on or were they, did they just, as they came home individually, somebody was already waiting for them and as they came in, somebody like had a gun on them and then another person took their coats, pulled them down and maybe tied their wrists. Like you pull the coat down to keep their arms from being able to swing, and then you tie their wrists. Okay, then later they're strangled to death and then placed down there, and the ligature that strangled them and the ligature that tied their wrists was removed. What do you think of that? Yeah, it would immobilize their arm movements and rule out murder-suicide. Um, I can't speak for Toronto Police, but as I understand it, the coats were pulled down, but not enough to immobilize them. There are also the detail about marks found on their wrists indicative of them being bound together, but those ties are removed and cannot be found. I struggle with this. How could you look at the scene and not think this was a case of double murder? The other thing I spent a lot of time trying to figure out was that the Shermans were in a seated position on the floor, their backs to the pool. There's no way you could strangle yourself sitting upright like that. It's different than jumping from a stool like we've seen in the movies. There's no fall here. So in my opinion, there can only be, there can be no murder-suicide or double-suicide. Right. So it's another glaring question mark. Yes. One of the things I've been trying to get through my journey through the, the court process is to find out from police, okay, you're not going to release documents that detail what your theory is now, but you give me and the public the first six weeks when it was considered murder-suicide, and let's see who you talked to and what made you arrive at the wrong conclusion. There is jurisprudence out there that says media and the public can't have access to other theories once they are debunked. I've not won that one, but I am working on it. The true public interest in this and why media are interested is did our uh, municip yeah, let's see, municipally funded force make some mistakes. If so, it's something that needs to be looked at. Right now, we have the chief of police saying, my officers did a great job. And here's another question. Another unique aspect of the case was the Sherman family rejecting the murder-suicide theory, hiring noted criminal defense lawyer Brian Greenspan with 72 hour, within 72 hours of the bodies being found. He assembled his own team to investigate and later set up a tip line offering a potential $10 million reward. How did that factor into the investigation? 
Well, Brian Scre- uh, Greenspan's marching order, in, in his words, were to put a second lens on this. Then, the, then he quickly thinks, we need to do a, a second set of autopsies, which I think was a good idea. What I do think is unusual is the length, the lengthy investigation where Toronto police say they now have 344 tips they have to check out, including at least one tip from a psychic. Oh boy. So the police are slowed down by having to check all this stuff out. The other thing I found very unusual and have never seen in a criminal case is that there is an enormous reward and the information is to go to the private team and not the police. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Here's a $10 million reward and just send it to our private team. Maybe they don't have any faith in the Canadian um, legal system. You know, the same system that you know, allowed a guy that chopped off somebody's head to and hold it up on a bus to get out and wa- uh, roam the streets five years later. Yeah. Greenspan, uh, Greenspan has framed this as two parallel investigations, but he is uh, representing the family, which was adamant early on about what could and could not be an outcome. So the idea that there are parallel police-style investigations is false. Greenspan's responsibility is to his clients. That's a good point. Then there is the issue of what he refers to as evidence. How does he get that to the police? Brian Greenspan obtained information that the crime scene was not, in their opinion, properly vacuumed, so they found evidence, jewelry found in the driveway that wasn't Honey's. Police hired a lawyer to review information from Greenspan and the Sherman family. It must be Maelstrom for the police to work with. Man, that's weird, too, because it almost feels like that secondary investigation is sort of mucking up what the police... You know, it it appears like they were investigating what the police should have investigated, but a secondary purpose for it could be that they're out there quickly gathering up stuff and finding little nuggets that maybe, you know, they don't really want the police to have, right? So there could be, like, two different reasons for that. Uh, with the tip line, people are more likely to go where there is a reward rather than to police. How is the information relayed from Greenspan's team to the police? They get information in emails or calls. They make a note or print out, put on USB key, and take it to the police. There have been 344 tips so far. Okay, do you have a theory why it took police six weeks to say it was a targeted double homicide? Oh, what happened? I haven't been reading the comments. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, that's how people kill themselves in prison. See, they lean forward, and it actually it knocks them out, and then they just quit breathing, you know, because it's, it's strangling them. You guys have seen that before, right? I mean... I think that's how uh, you know a lot of people in jail kill themselves. They're not hanging from the ceiling or anything. They just come up with a way where they pass out, and then their the pressure their body has on it ends up killing them. I do, and I try not to be too serving the Toronto Star serving. I was asked to investigate on January 6th and I spent a few weeks trying to find out not who killed them but whether it was was it murder, suicide, or double murder. I started interviewing people including Dr. David Shiasen, a retired deputy chief coroner who happened to be involved in the case who gave me permission to identify him. I got access to other forensic information and let's see. Well, let's find questions that are there appear to, be, appear to be so many miscues. All right. um, in your book, you write about the damage to Honey's face, which suggested the killing had a personal component, that the killer or killers felt differently towards husband and wife. Why was that worth mentioning? 
I had no access to police investigations, so I'm looking for clues, and that says to me that the person may have liked berry more than honey, but it could also mean that a person attacked honey and then strangled berry. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think that indicates somebody liking somebody more with a, a small bruise, they say, on an eye. We don't know what was going on. Honey told friends her husband was contemplating giving her a big financial gift. Her sister Mary was also telling people that Honey was giving her a lot of money. Why was that relevant? Hmm. Well, that's weird. Because wasn't the sister kind of cut out of the will? And then somehow she was going to get a lot of money. Maybe was telling. I don't know. Honey was given money for her needs, but not her desires. If she wanted to put in... A very expensive marble floor in their Florida condo. She could do that. Barry wasn't interested in spending money. He liked to give it away and felt his wife should be the same way. In the final years of her life, both Honey and Barry told friends she was going to come into between a hundred million and five hundred million. Then it became known that some of, of this might go to her beloved sister, Mary. Money, wow, so what if one of Mary's, somebody related to Mary wanted her to quickly get some of her money. Honey and Mary were very close. They might be the closest relationship in the Sherman's family. Honey was tough on her children. She wanted them to have jobs and pay bills. Barry was closer to them. He just, he would just give them money. From quite good sources, it was not unusual for the two children to receive hundreds of millions and the younger two children to receive in the low million. It was not unusual for the children to receive hundreds of million. <laughs> I don't know, something seems weird about the way that was written. Hundreds of million and the younger two children to receive in the low millions. It was a very dysfunctional situation with money in the Sherman family. Yeah, why wouldn't everybody just get the same amount, you know? That's so stupid when parents, you know, you're, you're going to favor somebody. Jeez. You also report that Honey appeared to have no will and that there was a search for it. That would have complications in terms of the order of their death. Could you explain? Nobody knows who died first. It's more likely Honey died first. None of her close friends remember having a will. Uh, it does matter a lot, right? Because if you could prove that Barry was killed first, that means the will of Honey would, I think, might proceed his because she was alive and then her will takes over. And that means whoever her will had, and the distribution of that will would take over. I think. I mean, I don't know how, you know, like... <laughs> If you die 30 seconds later, you know, how would, you know, is there a time frame that matters? Uh, let's see. Jonathan, Jonathan Sherman emerges. Hey, I got one. Say Jonathan, Jonathan Sherman three times quick. Come on, go ahead. Jonathan Sherman. <laughs> Jonathan Sherman. Jonathan. <laughs> That's a tough one, man. Jonathan Sherman. But say it really fast, three times. Can you do it? Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm saying that like Arnold Schwar uh, Horshack on Welcome Back Carter. I used to hate that guy. God. Well, thanks, uh, the other Heather. Tell me, uh, nobody out there liked Arnold uh, Horshack, did you? Yeah, you can't say Jonathan Sherman three times very fast. You did it? Jonathan Sherman, Jonathan Sherman, Jonathan Sherman. No, see the third one. Okay. Jonathan Sherman, Jonathan Sherman, Jonathan Sherman. Okay, I did it that time. Boom. It was a lot of um, just focus. But I did it. You, I, I proved it. Actually, it was just a replay button. Yeah, Yeah, didn't you hate the way he laughed and everything? I mean, why did they think he was a good character? 
I did, also didn't like it. That was amazing. I'll tell you what, probably the most amazing thing that ever happened in terms of the career of an actor was probably John Travolta, who pigeonholed himself as one of the stupidest people in the history of the world and then sort of evolved into having some really good parts and movies and, you know, becoming like an A-lister type actor. And usually you would just stay like Gilligan, for example. I mean, could Bob Denver ever done anything other than Gilligan? I mean, you'd see him in a, you know, maybe an older movie or something and you just go, oh, come on, that's Gilligan. All right, Jonathan Sherman emerges as an interesting figure in your book. You quote friends of Honey saying, Honey and Jonathan hated one another. So Jonathan, wasn't Jonathan, Jonathan's the adopted son, right? And also detail Jonathan's complex relationship with his father. Could you speak of that? I, I kind of want to hear about this one. There's one son and three daughters. The daughters were not interested in business. Jonathan is interested in business and with his father's financial help purchased a self-storage firm and property in what he sees as the new cottage in the new cottage country as the new cottage country. I have a chain of emails in the book from 2015 between Jonathan and Barry. It's quite acrimonious. At the time Cash is tight for Apotex. Barry had bet on drugs that didn't work out. It had happened before he was going to ride in, um, before he was going to ride it out. But he didn't have hundreds of millions to pass around. According to Jonathan, far too much of his father's money was going to Frank D'Angelo and not to him. Frank D'Angelo was a colorful, uh, colorful person and close friend of Sherman's, who Sherman bankrolled in numerous business ventures. Jonathan boldly asked for $250 million wow, to develop cottages and expand his storage business. Barry Sherman responds to lengthy emails with very short one-liners. In the final one, he says, D'Angelo is good at making mo movies. Here's the trailer to his latest one. It was put it was a put down by Barry to his son. I understand that after that I don't have emails but talk to people who did. Jonathan said to his sisters, Our father may be showing signs of incompetence. Maybe it's time to do something. Hmm. I asked Brian Greenspan about that. He said Jonathan was only being a good steward of family finances, and maybe that was the case, but there was no attempt I could see to have Barry removed. I then tracked financial payments. I can only look where Barry has put a charge on Jonathan's property. After this acrimonious discussion, there's no money for a year. Then the tap opens up again and in 2017 there's quite a big payment to Jonathan's business. It seems that things were much better between them. Hmm. But that was 2000, well that was in 2017. The email from Jonathan to his sister you quote has the subject line to fellow shareholders. You also report Jonathan wanted to be involved with Apotex succession planning with the business partner. I have probably talked to a dozen men who were sons of Barry Sherman's friends. Okay. Yeah. Barry was generous giving people employment. He was uh, desperate to have someone succeed him in the business. Jonathan wasn't doing that. He was doing his own thing. He also quote, that you call an eyebrow-raising comment Jonathan made at the funeral about his parents that he and his siblings were glad neither of you had to suffer like we are suffering now. You saw that as worth noting. Hmm. I don't know why that's... What's wrong with that? 
I think so. Only Jonathan spoke for the family. You can tell it's been a tough couple of days. You also can read between the lines about some of the comments he made, including mention of his mother falling when skiing and see the relationship isn't so great with his mother. What was I raising about saying neither of you had to suffer? Hmm. I guess it's kind of weird saying had to, you know, that, that phraseology. The book also chronicles fractures after the Sherman's death, including Honey's sister being exiled from the family. You also write about how Jack K. Barry Sherman's right hand at, at Apotex for 35 years and trustee of the estate was the subject of a rumor floated by Jonathan that he was somehow involved in the murders and he was later kicked out of Apotex. Some of this is stranger than fiction. Jack K. was asked to come back to be in charge of Apotex, one year and one day after the murder, murders, Jonathan Sherman and an Apotex executive ushered Kay out of the building. There's no gold watch, no party. There's mediation going on now because Kay was not offered anything after 35 years of service. It is the case that there is a lot of finger pointing going on. As I report, where they initially blame Frank D'Angelo then Jonathan says Jack K was involved. When Greenspan has written me, he says that my own sources, who I don't identify, may be guilty as well. There's a lot of finger pointing. Jeez. <laughs> it's almost like the, the, the Kennedy assassination at this point. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Wolfpack, can you send me a link to that? I've got a, there's this one idiot out there that creates like 10 copies of my account and they comment on people's videos and, you know. So maybe send me an email, would you? Here's my email address. So send me a link to that, that account. All right, right there. So send me an email to that, that one. All right. Thanks. You asked everyone you interviewed, where were you on the night of December 13th, the night the Shermans are presumed to have been killed? When you went to ask the children, Greenspan asked you to go th through him. He then said he couldn't answer because he was bound by police request. Did you hear that from anyone else? No, not at all. To the extent people had an alibi, they would try to check it out. I've asked police on the witness stand if they ever asked people not to talk to the media and they said no. Let's see, the Germans were powerful figures entrenched in establishment Toronto and establishment Canada. Family friends like Senator Linda Frum and Toronto Mayor John Tory spoke to the police on behalf of the family. To what extent did the Sherman's wealth affect your ability to report this story? I think, for instance, of how they successfully blocked access to what usually is public information, which is extraordinary. It is extraordinary that the Shermans have been able to block the will. I'm not even too sure how much is in that estate file. I've learned through the process people who have private businesses can shield most of their assets from probate. Okay. What about the details of the police investigation itself? What I have found very interesting is that when I had a detective on the stand in court, we go back every six months that the deal we have, he said, that's the deal we have. I can't answer on that because the will and estate is embedded in our police documents. That raises a lot of interesting scenarios for me because when I interviewed people about the will, it doesn't seem that other people are beneficiaries. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's a key thing in the will. That's the answer. But the detective used the same word several times. It's embedded throughout the ITO. Like the will is 
blocking, having, you know, it's like this living organism. <laughs> uh, you describe a major revelation during a court date last April when you were trying to get documents unsealed and you asked Detective Dennis Kim on the stand if police had a theory of the case. There was a long pause. He said, yes, we do. And I said, what does your theory mean? He said, it's an idea of what happened. I asked, what are your, who are your suspects? And the judge told me, you can't go further than that. <laughs> Shit. That was a eureka moment for you? A huge eureka moment. Then I asked him again if he had a theory of the case in October and wondered if he would backtrack. He said, yes. I asked, what is the, it, was it the same theory? He said, yes. I asked, is there a suspect? He said, I can't tell you. I asked, is there a person of interest? He said, I can't tell you. The most interesting thing that day was he revealed he got the Toronto Police Intelligence Unit to go through a voluminous, his word, amount of data. Hey, thanks, Dark Side. I am glad you are covering this case. Nice job, Gray. Yeah, I'm sure I'm going to miss something, you know, like, uh, I'm, I bet you, Lynette, uh, will up there will say something like, oh, yeah, I missed that part, right? <laughs> you know, but it's hard, you know. It's just like when you cover um, any case out there that other people have talked about. Like, if you went and did John Benet Ramsey, right, and you didn't have every single, and I, and I get that, too, I understand, you know, the people that are experts at it, that have covered it a thousand times or have been studying it for years and years and months and months, you know, they know everything, and I understand what would make them upset. I'm just kind of looking at it from a, uh, you, know, you know, broad lens and just trying to theorize a little bit. That's it. By the way, what comment did you delete up there, Lynette? <laughs> uh, we've been told the Sherman murder investigation has shrunk. Wait, uh, a huge recommend. Yeah, so he said his words, amount of data. Based on that, they're doing more production orders. And based on that, I think they're close. Okay, good. We've been told the Sherman murder investigation has shrunk to one detective. It's bigger now started with 50 detectives then down to one who produces production orders now they told me the original detective Brandon Price so that's always good news that means that they're bringing people back in because now they're honest probably like in the Delphi case right they, once they've started up again with this uh, catfishing angle I'm sure they brought people back and they're really focused in on that Uh, you're right. It would have been. It would have to be someone familiar with the house that was personal, not professional. I've spoken to people over the years about different types of homicides um, and strangulation. That's very close, intimate thing. That's different than hiring a hitman. Yeah, except they tried to make it look like a possible suicide by moving them around. So, you know, that's sort of, I don't know, you know. You also write that you think the killer or killers were professionals. One reason is the use of belts. One was taken from an upstairs bedroom. Well, if they were professionals, then how would they be personal? Organized criminals don't look for their murder weapons at the scene. I've not seen crime scene photos, but I was told belts were used. Barry was wearing a belt that morning. One honey bought him at Canadian Tire. The other belt was from the bedroom, or my supposition is that was uh, where the belt uh, was. I don't think a foreign object was brought into the house to do the killing. Why the pool? Because it's out of the way because the tile floor can be cleaned up easily. Huh? I don't need to know what a password is. You just send me a link to the video. 
Do you think this case will ever be solved? Um, I do, he said. That's one of the questions I asked Detective Ken, and I'm able to look at his answers four times over two years. This latest time, he said, the case is moving along well. It's very active. We're continuously optimistic. They seem very pleased with whatever this Toronto Police Intelligence report by civilian analysts told them. That appears to be a very big break in the case. <laughs> All right. You know, doesn't it feel like it's going to be, uh, you know, allegedly somebody related to the family that wanted to take them out but maybe wasn't committed by the family member themselves? A hitman, if you will. That's what it feels like, right? Are you actually going to go to sleep this time, Lynette? <laughs> Anyways, thanks for, you know, keep sending me the links and everything so we can go over it. All right? I appreciate it. You, you, uh, I, I had all these other files already set up, but then after you sent me the ones that you sent me, I, I said, okay, I'll do this today. All right? And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm sorry for the people that get offended really easily out here. I don't know what the deal is. You know, tonight's show was just a regular show. <laughs> you know, there was nothing, there's nothing weird going on. Uh, nothing should have been offensive or anything like that. You know, me and uh, Lynette have known each other for a long time. It's, you know, <laughs> it's the same shit, Yeah, you know? Like, she teases me in comments. I tease her in comments. Doesn't mean anything. So when you see, you know, so all I was just doing earlier was commenting when, when LM said, "We, we, you know, we love you, Lynette." And then Lynette came back later and said, "Oh, come on, you guys. I'm, I don't need any help. We're just goofing around, you know." So, anyways, there's always misunderstandings and shit, and it's really frustrating when you're just being yourself, just doing a show, and then it gets derailed. You know, but uh, you know, I was able to recover. But actually, let me—I do have this one last thing in here, though. See, there was a video that Toronto Star did, and maybe we can just watch parts of it because it's kind of interesting. I'll have to make it smaller, probably. But let's see. The scenario for what happened at fit. The only problem is, is it's like a produced video. So, what do you got? Honey and Berry last seen on December 13th. That's where the car was parked. See, that looks like that same car that we were looking at, right? And well, actually, let's just check. So, there's the actual photo of the vehicle there. And now, if we go down to the street view here, and we'll be able to tell here in a second. And then you go back up to, up in the, when you're using, um, Google Earth doesn't have this feature, but just for you guys, if you're using Google Maps, Google Maps, Google, 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 look at map, Google Earth. <laughs> look at, look at, look at Google Maps. Oh, really? Wow. I'm, I missed that one, Lynette. Yeah, so when you're using Google Maps, you can actually go up here and there's a, if you see this little clock right here, you can click on it. And if, as you can see, there's all these other dates that the Google Earth car drove by, right? So the one that we were looking at earlier that seemed to have a vehicle in it, I think was this 2014 one. And then you have to click on the image and then it switches over to Google Earth, and I think if we zoom in on that, that's the same vehicle. Look, notice the uh, where the license plate is, that shape right there that it's in, and the lights, here we go, right there, boom. All right, so that means, you know, that's the same exact car and everything just two years prior. To the side door. Here, you get a better view of the door, which was often unlocked. Barry and Honey rarely use the front door. 
So apparently that that's the there's a front door. Maybe that's the front door, but there's a side door right there. That's what they would go through. Close to the side door. Here you get a better view of the door, which was often unlocked. Carried upstairs from the basement and across the grand central hallway. The side door Honey normally used opens into a vestibule leading to the laundry room, kitchen, and breakfast area. Honey was likely home. Yeah, I... Sherman family and friends speculate Honey may have ran there to escape her attacker. That's right, because there was some shit in the bath. Hold on. Old case was sitting upside front of the house. The iPhone with its jeweled case was sitting upside down on the edge of the vanity. Yeah, so her phone was in the bathroom upside down on the vanity. Sherman family and friends speculate Honey may have ran there to escape her attacker. There are two possible stairway routes for an attacker moving Honey <laughs> from the main... See you later, Lynette Burns, you whack job. <laughs> Just kidding. ...floor to the basement. One is in the middle of the house, leading down from the grand hallway on the main floor to the basement rec room. The other is at the back, a spiral... ...findings to note, given that Toronto police you said find there was no online. sign of forced entry when they arrived. First, an open the basement window. With the house for sale, the wall under a window in a front room had been painted to cover water damage. The window was left open to air out the smell. Mm. Mm. So maybe somebody's in there waiting. Steps go up to the patio outside on the west side of the house. The realtor noticed that door was unlocked. It's possible this is how the killer or killers entered and left the Sherman home undetected. Barry Sherman would have driven his car down so the ramp that. and parked in one of six like spots. Six parking there spots? There are two exit garage? doors from the garage. Like a, freaking, uh... a small door into a utility The attackers would have then moved him past the spiral staircase and down a long hallway with the sauna and other rooms on the left and the garage on the right. At the end of the hallway is a door to the pool area. This is the pool room where the bodies were discovered. The Shermans were in what police have described as a semi-seated position. Belts looped around their See? necks were attached to a low railing. It's crazy, right? Eh? That brings us to a mysterious discovery. In a basement room near the room with the open window sat two life-sized human art figures the Shermans had owned since the 1980s. Created in a seated position, there was an eerie similarity to how the Shermans were positioned. Yeah, I think it's just absolutely unrelated. Just happened to have it. So that was another thing by Kevin Donovan, or I think it's Donovan, right? Um, yeah, Kevin Donovan. So anyways, all the links are in the description. You can go back and check them out. But what do you guys think? Do you think it was... A family member that hired somebody to get the ball rolling so they could have all the money that they needed. Here's what I would—I think is funny is, why would you want, how about you, instead of getting 200 million to create a, you know, some weird storage unit thing, why not just say, can I have 200 million? And then never work again another day in your life. Uh, you could even put it in a, a crappy bank and make a ton of money on interest, even if, it, even if it's one percent. You know, you make two hundred thousand a year just on that. Actually, no, you'd make uh, two million a year at one percent if you got two hundred million. Yeah, it feels like it's a family member, and they're paying for a, sort of a hitman to maybe do this. That's what it feels like. Because killing him for being a drug, you know, uh, the, the generic drug maker, that doesn't even, I mean, th that just happens. It, it's it's going to continue to happen. It doesn't matter if you kill somebody. You know, the only thing that would make sense to me is somebody greedy was thinking there'd be a payout 
You know, maybe the sister, you know, the sister of Honey. I wonder if there's somebody connected to her that was interested in, wow, we're going to have a ton of money for the first time. Except I don't know if the father had her in the will. So I think here's what the, the reason they want the will covered up, I think, is because the will probably suggests the possibility of various people. People that have a motive of some sort. I don't think it has anything to do... That's why the judge rejected it. It has anything to do with um, danger to them. I think it was the exact opposite. Yeah, I don't even know what's gone on with the will since then. Anybody know out there? Any of the super sleuths that have followed this up from the beginning? Have any of the children received payouts from the will? And that's the vibe you get. Awesome. Okay, here we go. Let me do. I'll do a poll really quick. Um, So both of them could be Hitman related, but I'm just going to give you two options, family or business related. And you could be a Hitman on either side. But there you go. I'm putting out a poll for you guys to answer. <laughs> okay, I'll do this email. Sorry. Yeah, I'm waiting for the poll. All right, so we got uh, family, and then you got business-related hitman. So the people that say business-related, what makes you think that? Like, what's uh, like, what are some of the elements that make you think there's something in the business world? I 
Yeah, maybe somebody didn't want to pay somebody back, Beholder. Well, I guess you'd still have to pay it back to the estate or something. Yeah, see, that's what I was saying, Patty. I just told you. Uh, I don't know what the last lawsuit is. And I just told you that I might not be covering every single one of the things that you want me to cover. Because I'm just doing it the way I want to do it. All right, so... I just found the one, the articles that I wanted to do in order. I don't get to know every little, single tiny little thing. Why don't you fill us in? Tell us what the lawsuit was about. <laughs> See, I knew this was going to happen at the end. Gray, you didn't talk about this. Gray, you didn't talk about... Hey, I'm just doing a show on it. You know, maybe we'll do another one with some updates. If you've got information, just send it along. You know, send along, we'll incorporate it, and, uh, but man, it sounds like you're complaining. It's wild. So you think bad dealings, jealous friends, business friends, yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you live in Toronto, and you don't even know about it. Wow, well, you probably know as much as we do now, because this is the first time we've looked at it. So anyways, it's 68 to 32 percent. Jonathan wanted his siblings to permit him to manage their share. Wanted, wanted his siblings. Yeah. He wanted to become Barry. Right? So that means Melissa, I mean, uh, Jonathan wanted to become Barry. Because remember how Barry controlled all the, everything? Yeah, it might be aliens, Raven. Don't know. But it's also a little bit weird to have a family, to have a lookout guy. You know, maybe they found a, a unit, a, a guy that knows a guy, you know, knows a couple guys. And one of them was the lookout guy, you know, wearing the classic uh, hats and everything. Oh boy, a blend of the two. Kind of like the two sketches, right? Somewhere right in between. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes money causes uh, big problems like that, right? So, uh, Patty Barnett, are you going to send me the links? So I can cover that on another show. Ah, uh, well, they're having another house built. And they were actually speaking to one of the builders uh, earlier in, in the evening, I guess. Well, they were supposed to speak at the house, but they spoke at his Apotech's work. I don't know. I mean... Wouldn't I, I don't think a family member would want to kill physically their own parent. But it's also interesting. Uh, it's, it's an adopted child, right? And maybe there were some issues with the mother. Well, you're not really our son anyway. You know, this weird stuff. I don't know why they hated each other. And so maybe it caused this huge rift there. And he didn't have the, the blood sort of connection where maybe you wouldn't, you know, it would be less chance that you would kill. I guess I'm not going to get... Oh, all right, thanks. Thank you, Patty. We'll check it out. But come on, you get, can you cut me a break sometimes if I miss some element? <laughs> Yeah, but how about you give us a, a quick uh, rundown really fast or just a quick sentence about what the new lawsuit is about. Because I went all the way to the 27th, which is only five days ago. Those are uh, motion zones. Herophant 7. The, the, the case is solved. There's no, you don't need to keep looking into the case. I've made, I've made many videos 
explaining what the red boxes were. Everybody knows what they're, they were for. When you set up the, the surveillance footage, you can actually draw square or red squares, and then they're also predictive too. So if uh, there's motion in one square and it's going in a certain direction, it might start getting ready to capture again. Yeah, it's not the right top topic, but I know that one. You know what's weird is people are still looking at that thing. It was an absolute accident. There is zero chance there was a murder in that case. And people just can't let it go. They just keep going over and over. He was supposed to testify regarding this in D.C. Jessica Schubach. Wait, the parents disperse their money differently with the children yeah but let's say it's 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 uh it's in stone though jessica schubach right so let's say each kid was supposed to get a different amount of money and you kill the parent well you're only going to get this little bit of money but maybe it's like well hell i want my money now then if i'm gonna have that way you know i don't really know hey living it you're gonna hear some drama in the middle that had nothing to do with any of the outside drama but sorry about that we had our own people trolling very strange I saw one of your videos yeah it had 2 million views yeah I don't even know why that one had 2 million views <laughs> yeah oh <laughs> you'll get your Hi, popcorn freak right. fam I'll have to watch all of this later, but I made it. Yay. Oh, good, good to see you living it. As in, living the dream. <laughs> yeah. Well, this month we're going to donate. We're only going to, we're going to send it probably only a thousand into the, um, the uh, identifinders fund and that'll completely cover the third case the uh, Addison County Doe and then throughout the month like maybe even at some time this week I'll donate some money to you know we'll get back on to the um, helping out Texas Equisearch Rain and uh, Nick Mech I think those three right there are perfect don't you guys think Nick Mech Rain and um, Texas EquiSearch. It's like you got a searching organization that's phenomenal. NICMEC, which is uh, helps against all the predators against children, and then RAIN is violence against women. Got them all. So we'll have to hit those up throughout the month. Well, thanks, Jay King. You know, it's weird, too, because I, I I was just having a normal show, and then all of a sudden it turns into this weird stuff at some point. But uh, I, I, I don't know. That's, I guess that's the thing. I just don't handle that well. I don't really know how it, where it comes from. It just, it's bizarre. It's very tough. Th this whole YouTube experience doing live shows is a tough thing to do. You know, you, you get a lot of different people with different personalities. Some people don't know when you're just flipping them crap or, you know, teasing them or really being mean, mean, you know, like really mean, mean. You know, I'm, I'm very rarely actually like pissed off or angry at some, you know, like I don't like somebody. It's usually like a comment that somebody makes. I go, God, that's ludicrous. And I'm not even looking at, I don't even like their name and everything doesn't even mean anything it's just what I'm saying and then all of a sudden it's taken so personally and then they go around and they, they just hate it uh, Rain R-A-I-N-N -N, is for uh, the violence against women
Yeah, they do the rape kits, and um, you know, it's just a organization to help women who have had violence perpetrated against them. Uh, it was this video called "I Figured It Out" or something. It wasn't even like I made way better videos in the Kanika Jenkins case than the "I Figured It Out" one. That one has like over two million views for some reason, where some of the other ones that are freaking awesome have like 80,000 or something, which is way more than a lot of the videos I have now. And the reason, um, in that case, I was the one voice of reason out of, I would say, dozens and dozens of people making videos. I was the one person that actually was um, putting out the truth, which happened to be against what was popular. <laughs> you know, what was popular was to turn that case into a, a wild conspiracy theory of a murder. And what I actually purchased, and I shared it with other YouTubers, you know, to make sure they had it, and they still, oh yeah, even though they could see what I was saying, they didn't want to do it. But I had all the surveillance footage of every camera that was available, and even though there was some missing cameras, the video that you see just shows a clear story. It's absolutely clear as hell and just simple to... It's just simple. All right, guys. Three hours, 43 minutes. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go up here. Thank you to Norweg. And uh, new member, Judy Isler Herod. Then Lynette Burns. Cammie Curry. Uh, Jessica Schubach. Mag. Tra and by the way, everybody, I like LM. I've always liked her. Uh, I just don't know where we get those weird moments. <laughs> where those come from. Like there's some, like a week straight where she's really cool and everything. And then I don't know where, boom, you know? And I don't know if it's like she isn't getting a joke that I'm doing or ribbing her or something. I don't know what it is, but it really, it doesn't go well. It really spins out of control quick. Yeah, the Kanika Jenkins case I covered for months because it was just a treasure trove of opportunity to debunk the hell out of people with absolutely factual information that was irrefutable and it was easy to do and it was also an important thing to do because it was spiral, spiraling out of control. Yeah, well, thanks, Jessica. Right, so and we got Mag up here, Jessica Schubach, uh, yeah, so we had Cami Curry, at, this is after Lynette Burns, Jessica Schubach, Mag, Tracy, Thank you. And uh, Kathy Frydenmaker, Angela Vincent, then Mag with a, she gave me a skeleton key to get me the hell out of the prison that I was in. And then uh, Amber Maiden, Ink, Twin Nine, B Mountains, Hillbilly Uncensored, Sherlock Hemlock, Eugenie, Tracy Nixon, uh, Peggy Day, Your Gypsy, Sooner History, and then Mag, she said she was proud to be a freak. Oh, well, I really appreciate that. It made me, well, you made me feel better during that really shitty moment in there. It was weird. Uh, Billy Juliana. Billy Juliana again. Thank you very much. Tracy Nixon. Carolina T. Your Gypsy. And uh, Billy Juliana saying, all right, you can proceed now. <laughs> Hopefully we got back to it in time. Uh, Rhea Mazarone. Kennelly Woodward Stone, Bama Forever, and then Lynette said, Gray, quit your belly aching and get on with the show. She was joking around too. And then I know. I let's see. Okay. And then Dark Side, J D and Livin' It. There was another member up there, but I don't know where that one went. Where'd it go? Maybe that was before the show, maybe? Yeah, don't see it. 
anyways i hope you guys got some value out of tonight's show and got something from it i thought it was pretty interesting i think we have all have a better feeling for it you know they they get home around 8 30 they uh sounds like somebody may have encountered them as they came home individually on their own and then they were both maybe pro, you know brought to a certain place then strangled and then placed and staged by the swimming pool and there was an individual that was is seen on camera showing up to the house and then there's also an individual leaving the house and they show us a surveillance footage at 1.3 miles away from the house and it looks like maybe it was a guy that was um, on a lookout there's a lot of family drama going on. They have adopted son. He, he was a gay adopted son. Um, he had a business that he was working on that failed. Apparently he got some more money to do it. There's different amounts that different family members were getting in their will. I mean, a lot of crazy stuff going on. So, and it doesn't sound like the police were doing a very good job at the beginning. They've done data dumps, doing... Uh, searches and actually doing tests to determine what kind of signature comes out on so phones in a specific area and they're using that to determine if these 35 phones that they of uh, people of interest matched some of the signatures and they must have evidence that maybe somebody was surveilling them and uh, you know they're just trying to find out the who sounds like they're onto something so cool well i'm glad you guys are all here tonight uh sorry for the delay and the little bit of the drama in the middle there i don't know what i don't know how to stop it but <laughs> i guess i could try to ignore it but it's hard to ignore when you get comments that are so you know just it's tough it's difficult to do you know. so anyways we will see you guys tomorrow everybody i don't i'm not gonna i gotta go to sleep i don't have time to do the the wrapping but uh, we've been on here for three hours and 50 minutes. And I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the show. All right. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. And a two, and a three, and a four, and a... Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a... Angry. Get some sleep, great I'm a oh, certified I human me. lie detector. Gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Professor Green is gonna, gonna give another lecture. lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector. Fool the flagger, intercepter, and I'm meaner than a spider. Who did? Who did Jennifer? Inspector with all respect, John. Just remember, I have a temple fucking check. I, I have no agenda. agenda. I'm a pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. All right. Yeah, Thanks, I'll everybody. Get right back to work. Awesome. Right, <laughs> yes, everybody. Have a good night's sleep tonight. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. I need a good night's sleep because I went to sleep way too late. And, um,. Woke up way too early, given the fact that I went to sleep way too late. And that's a, something I shouldn't do. Uh, but hopefully I'm going to get... Tomorrow I'm going to make a call to find... I'm going to see if I can get some... Uh, I did get a sleep study done. I wore a harness the other day, and it came back as like mild sleep apnea. And so... Uh, we'll see what we'll see what goes on with that. I gotta. We, I think it'd be so amazing to have a good night's sleep again, just once. <laughs> it's been so long. All right, everybody, be safe out there. Yeah, good boy, everybody. Oh God! Oh God!